welcome uh, folks around the world who have joined online and uh, guests who are on site here. So some of you, if you missed, have networking. Uh, next month also we're planning to have the second one. So please do come and visit. And uh, this is going to be a monthly seminar going forward. So first of all, let me introduce, uh, I'm Ashutosh Datta from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, I uh, also the chair for SEM Baltimore chapter. I'm going to introduce my fellow colleagues in the organizing committee and the executive committee. Um, so we uh, actually started this uh, in 2021, uh, but due to COVID and other things, I've not been able to really um, kick off this. And uh, so this is kind of the first inaugural meeting. And um, although we call it Baltimore chapter, uh, in a way it is global. Uh, because there are people from around the world, uh, thanks to the internet, and that's probably the uh, topic of the talks today. Um, we'll hear from Professor Kleinrock how internet started, right? That made it really possible for us to uh, be close to each other even if we are far off. Um, so that's the beauty of internet, right? So with that, uh, let me start again. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, good morning, good evening, good day. I know there are some folks probably waking up in Far East. And China, Japan, and India, maybe it's three o'clock. Um, yeah. So I wanted to first, uh, and, and folks here within the United States and and Europe and the rest of the world. Um, so I, I like to first uh, introduce my uh, colleagues and people who are in the executive committee, uh, and also like to. Uh, acknowledge Dr. Rob Semmel, uh, director of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, uh, who was instrumental in getting this uh, chapter started. So in 2021, when uh, we found um, there is no ACM, ACM chapter actually in DC, Virginia, or Baltimore area, uh, I did reach out to Dr. Semmel, and he said, yeah, by, by all means, let's start it. And so I did reach out to ACM, ACM headquarters and my colleagues who are uh, over here, uh, it's mostly from Johns Hopkins APL, and Johns Hopkins University, we just started this committee and we welcome others um, in the neighborhood, please come and join. Um, so uh, Jeffrey Chavis, who is the vice chair, uh, is right here, he'll be uh, also speaking to the audience later on. Uh, Random Goin, who is our webmaster. We are all volunteers, by the way. Uh, Tamian Zucker, uh, who is the secretary for SCM chapter, Baltimore. Uh, Ken Smith from Johns Hopkins, who is the membership development chair. And Wale Akinpelu, who is our treasurer. Uh, we are volunteers and hopefully you know you'll, you'll get a chance to see them I mean, today actually many of them will talk to you uh, you want to visit the website baltimoreacm.org please do visit so we have an exciting uh, agenda today and there are in addition to the talk from uh, acm president uh, professor gabriel kotsis and welcome address from dr Rich, uh, ralph samuel from uh, um, apl we have three interesting talks Origins of the Internet, Professor Kleindrup, and Digital Inclusion from uh, Professor Henning Schulderin. Uh, they kind of go back to back in a way. You will see how Internet was done and then how we like to make it available for the rest of the world. And then uh, Technology Development During COVID-19 by our NASA scientist, uh, Dr. Eptel Erikson. Um, and I'll go through the agenda uh, a little later. Uh, sorry, okay. Yeah, so I also wanted to tell, uh, this is the first kind of the inaugural seminar. Uh, we have planned a lot of exciting events. And the next big event, uh, in addition to our monthly event, is going to be um, on June 14th, right here. And that we are going to collaborate with uh, IEEE. Uh, there are a lot of IEEE section around and future network. So it's going to be a joint event on NextG. So that's going to be the first kind of NextG summit. Uh, you know, organized by ACM and, and IEEE. Um, the call for paper is out there. Uh, please do visit and submit your call for proposals, right? Speaking proposals. So we like to make it uh, worldwide and also available to the rest of the world in the spirit of ACM and IEEE. And there'll be some invited talks as well. So please do put that in your calendar. So th this is the lineup for today. Uh, as I was telling, according to the agenda, Kotsis is the SEM president, Dr. Alp Semmel, uh, director for JHU uh, APL. Professor Kleinrock, uh, I think he's already in the audience. Dr. April uh, Erickson from NASA, and Professor Henning Schulder, um, he'll be speaking later on. So I'll, I'll give a little bit introduction of ACM. Um, you know, I'm, I myself is an IEEE volunteer as well, 
I used to be the Princeton Central Justice Section Chair. And when I found I came here four years back, I said, let's, let's do something on the ACM side. And everybody kind of uh, like that. And so this is like a you know, combined effort. So by the way, 75 years of ACM uh, as a science and profession, right? So um, that's very interesting. So special year for us, right? So we should be doing more of some of these uh, outreach. Um, so this is a uh, obviously educational scientific society. Uh, we are trying to look into the walls, uh, computing needs, scientific needs. How can we uh, reach out to educator, researchers, professionals uh, to do something for the humanity? Right. That's the whole idea. Uh, so we uh, do that through collaboration with other institutions. Uh, we also provide lifelong learning, career development, and professional networking. Uh, it was formed in 1947, so it's 75 years. Um, there are many things, uh, facts about ACM, uh, about 103,000 members, 76,000 professional members, 27,000 student members. There are lots of professional chapters, and this is a professional chapter, but there is also a student chapter as well. And I, I was also talking to a friend of mine, I think they have a chapter in DC now, we, we're probably trying to collaborate at some point. Um, it's a very diverse, as you can see, um, in terms of geographic uh, and gender diversity. Uh, we have both. Uh, there are professionals with master's and PhD degrees. Uh, publication, there are 38 special interest groups. I personally am a member of uh, SIG Mobile. Uh, with, uh, SIG Mobile is a special interest group in mobility. Uh, there are 85 sponsored conference, you know, overall 170. Sometimes you get co-sponsorship, right? And sometimes they're just sponsored by ACM. So what we do uh, is advancing the field, conveying ACM's in importance. Uh, we uh, advance the computing image of profession, right? So it may be working in different areas. So we try to kind of complement what IEEE is doing, and many times we also overlap and do combined events. So the whole idea is having this ACM Baltimore chapter will help us to really collaborate with neighboring universities, industries, and this can be a platform to bring them together, and a lot of new ideas will generate. I mean, I have seen that through my association with IEEE, and uh, this will be an interesting platform for that. All right, so how can you get involved with ACM? Uh, as I said, this is a volunteer-led organization. We don't get paid. This is our passion. We want to do something for the community. We do it. Um, so there are a lot of ways you can organize conference. You can be editor in the journal, reviewing papers. Um, you know, you can participate in many boards and committees, etc. Right? Uh, how do you get involved? Obviously, if you have a passion to contribute to the society uh, using uh, computing as a science or you want to do any remote part of the world, how can you go and help? Uh, this is uh, you know, one of the right professional societies you can actually get involved. So while you enrich your professional uh, technical knowledge, at the same time you use that in collaboration with your um, you know, collaborators or partners and help the society, right? That's the whole idea. And you will see there are a lot of fun there, by the way. I mean, I, I can tell you from personally myself. Uh, there are educational standards, conferences, a lot of things you can do. Okay, I'll just flip through it. Uh, all right, so obviously uh, things cannot be done by just one person. Uh, they need people like volunteers like us, and also at the same time, we can reach out to the industry leaders. So the industry leaders, they may not have their own time. But they have people in the industry uh, who can be instrumental in trying to get something done. So that's so important. And similarly for the universities, the faculty, professor, they may not have their own time, but the student, postdocs, they can be part of this mission, right? So the, this is a collaborative effort, right? So take a hand in leading ACM. So that's what I was trying to say. Uh, lead ex lend expertise in your chosen field, right? So there are 38 special interest groups. As I said, I'm, I'm the mobility group that I see graph and a lot, lot of uh, other things. So depending on your specific area, you can be part of the special interest group. And we are thinking up within um, uh, Baltimore chapter trying to see something similar, create a new special interest group, right? And they can have their own conferences. Like Mobicom is one of the premier conference uh, for SIG Mobile, right? Or something similar so you can kind of bots up Right, uh, you can create those kind of things. Um, 
you know, there are many conferences you can uh, uh, organize that, be part of, can be a program chair, committee chair, etc. right? Okay. Uh, and, and there are more to that. You can be editor in chief, associate editor. There are different ways to uh, advance your careers and professions. All right. We go further. How to get involved, as I said, publication, six conference, um, different uh, educational activities, uh, become an officer in your local student or professional chapter, just like we are doing. You know, uh, you know, we, we're going to have rotations that are opportunity for others also to be part of it, right? Uh, and public policy as well. It is not only technical. You can also take part in some of the public policy and how to save um, the rules, what's happening around the world. How can you influence that, right? Um, so in, in summary, ACM empowers you to uh, help save the association's future with a wide array of opportunities, and you can get involved. Um, and networking, that's another important thing. I, I think I talk, talked about it, you know, that's the beauty of networking. I know we have a few folks uh, on site in the room today, and there are lots in the, uh, in the Zoom. Um, so that's a good way, you know, uh, to meet people around uh, you in, in the neighborhood. Uh, or virtually and try to exchange ideas. So that's uh, another beauty part of uh, ACM or any professional societies. Last but not the least, we don't uh, work just to get awards, right? But uh, there are several ways uh, the members uh, can be, you know, rewards in the sense, you know, whatever you do, it's kind of not only you are getting the rewards, others are getting influence, right? So I, I wanted to highlight because many of you are doing a lot of good things, and SEM does recognize them, right? So there are many ways you can actually be part of these awards. Just wanted to let you know. Uh, awards come later, but you know the passion and work is the most important thing. And again, coming back to agenda, now uh, I just finished with the first one here, the Baltimore chapter introduction, SEM overview. Um, so at this time, uh, I will, uh, have the video recording from uh, ACM President Professor Gabriel Kotsis. Uh, she could not be here today. Uh, she's in Europe. It's almost like six hours, almost midnight. Uh, but I'll just uh, briefly introduce Professor Kotsis, and then we'll play her uh, video recording. Professor Kotsis, uh, she's an Austrian computer scientist. She's now the ACM President. She's a full professor at computer science at Johannes Kepler University uh, in Austria. Uh, Sil is the Department of Telecommunication, uh, Division of uh, Cooperative Information Systems. Let me just slide that. Uh, before this, she was the Vice Rector uh, of the University. She's also uh, the longstanding Chairwoman for the University's Austria's Policy Committee on Research. Uh, 2003 to 2007, she was the president of Austrian Computer Society and the first female holding this position in Austria. Uh, Professor Kotsis is a founding member of ACM Europe Council, uh, serving at the council from 2008 to 2016. Uh, since 2016, uh, she has been uh, JKU's representative in the Asia Uninet Academic Research Work uh, that promotes cooperation among European and South Southeast Asian Public Universities. Uh, she's a distinguished member of ACM, and she's the current uh, ACM president. So with that, I will uh, just play her video recording. Welcome to the kickoff meeting of the ACM Baltimore chapter. I would like to begin by congratulating Ashutosh Luther, chair of the chapter, and Jeffrey Chase, vice chair, and all the other officers for starting this regional chapter. ACM itself was established in 1947 by a small group of researchers interested in computing machinery. As the field of computing has grown from that interest by a few people in 1947 to being a part of virtually every aspect of our lives, it is even more important to join our forces in the community to ensure that our activities remain true to the original vision of ACM as it is written in the founding. The association is an international scientific and educational organization dedicated to advancing the art, science, engineering, and application of information technology, serving both 
professional and public interest by fostering the open interchange of information and by promoting the highest professional and ethical standards. Over the years, ACM has developed a set of core values that guide the services, products and activities of the organization. These core values are technical excellence, education and technical advancement, ethical computing and technology for positive impact, as well as diversity, equity and inclusion. You can see that these core values are directly reflected in ACM's strategic goals that you will find on the website. I will just mention maybe here, for example, our efforts in the digital library, where we plan to have them fully open within the next five years, or by making ACM a welcoming environment for all, promoting educational resources to the computing community, providing technical information to policymakers and the public, and promoting ethical computing. I would like to mention a few examples about what ACM specifically does. You see here something, for example, about the SIGGRAPH 2022 conference, which is one of ACM's major conferences for both researchers and professionals working in visual arts. Every year, ACM sponsors nearly 200 conferences that typically take place around the world, although due to COVID, these events have mostly been held virtually. We are hoping that we will soon be able to return to in-person conferences and events. On the upper right, there is a picture of Crossroads magazine, this is an ACM publication related to our education efforts. On the bottom left is a screen of a shot of a recent tech talk about automating aspects of software development. Tech talks are one of ACM's offerings for practitioners, which are mostly software engineers and others who develop and apply technology. And on the bottom right is a cover from 2019 issue of ACM's flagship magazine, The Communications of the ACM, where you'll see that we're also highlighting special regional sections, in that example, the Indian region. For all of you who use the digital library, it is important to realize that the library is no longer simply a collection of PDF printed documents. The digital library now also has an extensive collection of author and speaker videos, as well as reusable software and data sets. So please, if you haven't visited the ACM digital library recently, have a look at this enhanced functionality. Also for authors, there is an enhanced functionality. We now have the ability to create author profiles and also claim, for example, all your publications, correct errors that may show up in your publication profile. If you have access to the digital library, just look in and see how you can update your profile by clicking on the upper right in your screen, which is circled by the red circle here. In addition to what ACM does for practitioners, educators and researchers, much of it freely available, there are many other ways in which ACM actively gives back to the entire computing profession. For example, ACM's Code of Ethics provides useful guidelines about ethics for practitioners, often specifically addressing the needs of software engineers. ACM has an awards program that honors significant contributions to computing later today um, you will probably hear more about that. ACM also has a speakers program that contribute to professional development. And as I mentioned at the beginning, diversity, equity and inclusion is very important to ACM. And we have several councils and initiatives addressing this. Finally, ACM also strives to provide expert technology information to policymakers and the public. ACM's Global Technology Policy Council as well as ACM's Europe TPC and US TPC have provided briefs to provide such technical information on topics such as algorithm transparency, climate change or facial recognition. In closing, let me just mention that, as you can compute on your own and see on the slide, ACM is reaching a major milestone this year. We are celebrating our 75th anniversary. In June, there will be a major event featuring talks on many aspects of computing. This day-long program will very much honor the past, but we will have a series of panels that will be very forward-looking. You can see these topics for the panels here, including, for example, the human-centered AI or connections at scale or global societal challenges. This event will be live streamed, but also recorded for viewing later. So look for announcements from ACM about this event and how to watch it. 
In addition, the communications of ACM magazine will be featuring a number of papers devoted to looking back at the history of computing as well as looking forward to what comes next. And again, of course, there will be a lot of social media and Twitter features highlighting ACM 75 years and the most significant changes to computing over these 75 years. So be on the lookout for those. With that, once again, congratulations to the founding members of this chapter, but all the other members or potential, hopefully, new members in the Washington DC, Virginia and Maryland area. I wish you a successful kickoff meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kotsitz. Obviously, she could not be here today. I'm hoping she could join us in future uh, uh, in person. And Professor Kurtzis, thank you again for your encouragement, support uh, within your uh, presidency we formed this chapter. And I'd like to um, offer this uh, token of appreciation is a virtual plaque. It will be uh, shipped to you. Uh, again, I uh, appreciate your support and uh, encouragement. Uh, with that, let me go to the next uh, talk. I'd like to invite uh, Wale Akinpalu, my colleague, and also the XCOM member, ASEAN Baltimore chapter, uh, to take over the stage. Thank you so much, Ajitosh. Our welcome message is from Dr. Rav Simel. Uh, before we watch his recorded video, let me introduce Dr. Simel to you. Uh, Dr. Simel became the eighth director of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory on July 1, 2010. Prior to becoming director, Dr. Sime served as the founding head of APL's Applied Information Sciences Department and Infocentric Operations Business Area, which conducted fund, uh, foundational research and development in the areas of cyber and information operations, information assurance, intelligence systems, and global information networks. Dr. Simet also has led and served on a variety of federal government science and technology boards, panels, and committees. He has been a member of the Defense Science Board and STRATCOM Advisory Group. And he is currently a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and before joining laboratory in 1986, Dr. Simet held leadership and technical positions with Wang Laboratories, MADA Corporation, and the US Army. He is a member of the ACM. He earned his Bachelor's of Science degree in engineering from the United States Military Academy in West Point, a Master of Science degree in systems management from the University of Southern California, a Master of Science degree in computer science from the Johns Hopkins University, and a PhD degree in computer science from the University of Maryland. Uh, let me now play his welcome message for you. Hello, everyone, and greetings to the attendees of this gathering of the Association for Computing Machinery. I very much appreciate this opportunity to say a few words. First, congratulations on your 75th anniversary. It doesn't seem like very long ago that we at APL marked our 75th, and we are now quickly approaching our 80th anniversary. It is amazing to consider just how much has changed in the lifespans of our organizations, and yet, how critical both of our institutions remain to the challenges we face in the world today. Congratulations also on this inaugural meeting of the Baltimore chapter. It has been a long time coming. As a member of ACM for decades, I understand the importance of this organization to the field of computer science and to computing more generally. With this new chapter, the members of the Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C. region will have better access to seminars, networking events, and opportunities to collaborate with the many technical companies, government agencies, and research labs in the area. ACM's role in bringing together educators, researchers, and practitioners to learn from and support their peers is as crucial today as it has ever been. Personally, I have learned much through various ACM publications and sponsored events over the years. ACM was my go-to organization when I was actively conducting research, and in my current role, ACM has helped keep me aware of the latest developments. I am also proud of the involvement of our staff in ACM over the years. Of our more than 8,000 staff members, nearly 80% are technical. And we have quite a few ACM members, including several, who are senior and distinguished members. 
In fact, APL actively supports staff members to join many professional societies. They are wonderful opportunities to share ideas and expertise. To this end, we fund professional society membership for all of our staff. We believe this kind of engagement is essential for professional development and to the lab's goals to share knowledge with the world and to be part of a vibrant innovation ecosystem. I note in particular that a number of the topics addressed by ACM play a significant role in advancing ethical computing for the benefit of all of us. With rapidly developing capabilities in artificial intelligence, as well as in other critical computing areas, this is more important than ever. So, I extend my thanks to the attendees here today, especially to the volunteers who made this event possible. I also look forward to watching the ACM Baltimore chapter develop into a hub for networking, collaboration, and innovation. I know we are off to a great start hosting the first NextG Summit, which takes place at APL in June. In closing, thank you for inviting me to share some thoughts. And thank you to the organizers of today's gathering, including ACM's president, Gabrielle Kotsis, headquarters staff and volunteers, this evening's speakers, and especially the Baltimore chapter chair and my colleague, Ashutosh Dutta. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable event. Our special thanks to Dr. Sime for his inspiring message. As a token of appreciation, I would like to present to him a plaque that reads as follows. Association for Computing Machinery, Baltimore Chapter, ACM, Baltimore Chapter, extend his appreciation to Dr. Ralph D. Simmel for delivering inaugural invited talk, ACM, Baltimore Chapter Inaugural Seminar 2022, Lauren Maryland, February 24, 2022. I will now invite Jeff Chavis to come to the podium. Thank you, Wally. Thank you all for being with us either in person or virtually. My name is Jeffrey Chavis and I'm the vice chair of the Baltimore chapter of ACM. And it gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity, honor and opportunity to introduce our first speaker for the evening. Our first speaker for the evening is Professor Leonard Kleinrock. Professor Kleinrock is a distinguished professor of computer science at UCLA. He is considered a father of the internet, having developed the mathematical theory of data networks, the technology underpinning the internet as an MIT graduate student in 1962. His UCLA host computer became the first node on the internet in September 1969, from which he directed the transmission of the first internet message. Dr. Kleinrock is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, is an IEEE fellow, an ACM fellow, an INFORMS fellow, a CHM fellow, an IEC fellow, an inaugural member of the Internet Hall of Fame, the Guggenheim Fellow, and an eminent member of Ada Kappa Nu. Among his many honors, he is the recipient of the National Medal of Science, the Erickson Prize, the NAE Draper Prize, the Marconi Prize, the Dan David Prize, and the Okawa Prize the BBVA Frontiers of Knowledge Award, and the ACM SIGCOM Award, the IEEE Leonard G. Abraham, Abraham Prize Paper Award, and the IEEE Harry M. Good Award, along with the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Medal. The next voice you will hear will be of Professor Leonard Kleinrock, and let me just say that I got the opportunity to meet Len many years ago at the TTI Vanguard Con Conference um, Len is an amazing individual and is an even better storyteller, and it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Professor Leonard Kleinrock. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to discuss with you, if you will, the origins of the internet. Um, you heard some of the elements in that introduction earlier. I'm going to fill in some of the details. So, 1969, going back a few years, was an incredible year. First man landed on the moon. A bunch of young people were dancing all over up in New York State. An event with probability zero occurred. 
first 40, 747 to, to the flight. There was a killing spree in Los Angeles. Oh, and by the way, the internet was born and nobody noticed. Even we who were there did not notice. And so I wanna talk about those early days. There was a culture that was prevalent at that time, around the time we did this early work. And we were using words like the following, words like ethics, trust, open, free, shared. This was the early internet culture. It's the way we thought about the world. And it allowed us to have an amazing productive era of innovation, of new development, of research and engineering. And uh, unfortunately, it's not quite the case today. And I wanna go through some of this history with you. So what makes the internet tick? Well, you all know, basically, it's the people. People who contribute their creative juices to the network and the culture, which allows them to, in fact, do that sharing in an open, free, ethical way. And essentially, as a result of those two, we end up creating communities. That is, in some sense, the power of the internet. And of course, the future is already here. Everyone knows about the internet. My 19-year-old granddaughter knows about it. My 19-year-old mother knew about it, and they were both on the internet at the same time. It's penetrating every aspect of our lives, but it's only exited its early teenage years. During that period, it was acting like a teenager. It was mischievous, erratic, unruly, and disobedient. And we hoped that it would grow up and mature and remove this kind of behavior and become a responsible citizen. Unfortunately, we've seen it's not quite done that. So let's look at a brief history of the internet. How far back was the vision when people began to think about what we now use and think of as the internet? I'm going to quote basically a very early uh, a phrase that was used, a, a prediction, and uh, I'm going to paraphrase it. Basically, whoever this was said, it'll be possible for a businessman in New York to instantly communicate with his colleague in London or elsewhere using a device no larger than a watch to deliver any picture, character, drawing, or print anywhere in the world. Now, if you think about what's being said here, this is a vision of what we now call the internet. It's got many of the elements, speed, instant, tiny device, simple device, send all kinds of media across. And in fact, uh, at almost no cost. Well, the person who said this was that gentleman whom you will recognize as Nikola Tesla. And he had that vision more than a hundred years ago. So the idea is the vision was there. It just had to wait for technology to catch up with the vision to be in fact realized and implemented. There were other early visionaries some years later. In 1938, H.G. Wells with his world brain. In 1945, Vannevar Bush with his brilliant idea of a collective memory, he called it the Memex. In 1960, Licklater articulated this thing he called the man-computer symbiosis put people and machines together and you get some wonderful creativity. I had a vision in 1969. And one of the things I did in that period was to show the following picture on many of my talks in the 1970s. This is a picture of somebody sitting at a terminal, gaining access to whatever's out there, which we now call the internet. There's no power cable. There's no communications cable. It's a kind of wireless ethereal communications. So the vision was there by many people. Now, before this, the beginning of the internet, there were two parallel threads that were taking place. And we're gonna go through both of them. The first is what I like to call the theoretical thread. It started when I entered MIT in 1957, and we'll follow that in a moment. But the second thread was the government thread. And that was all about the following. Some of you may recall that in 1957, 58, there was something called the International Geophysical Year. It's that year the scientists around the globe were measuring its properties, its oceans, its mountains, its continent, its atmosphere, its climate. And in the early part of that year in 1957, the Russians jumped the gun and launched Sputnik. And they sent that satellite around the world beeping the way you just heard, 
annoying everybody and essentially annoying then President Eisenhower. And he realized at that point that the United States was no longer the leader in technology. And he vowed that, vowed that would never happen again. So four months later, he created the Advanced Research Projects Agency. The function of the agency was basically to support technology, engineering, math, science, to bring up the capability of America and become number one in those fields again. But that didn't stop the Russians. Just a year and a half later, they launched a spacecraft that hit the moon. A year and a half after that, they put the first man in space. A little while later, they whacked Venus with a spacecraft. And that got President Kennedy a little upset. And he said, we're gonna put a man on the moon by July of 1969. Well, sure enough, that happened. So we're gonna follow that thread in a little while, but let's take the theoretical thread first. I started my PhD research, as I said, when I went to MIT, and I decided to find a problem to work on. And I wanted to do a problem that would have potential in an area nobody else was working on. And at MIT, I was surrounded by computers, and I recognized that sooner or later, they're gonna to have to talk to each other. And in fact, I realized there was no appropriate networking technology that would handle that. So here was a problem that was new, nobody was working on it, an important problem, one that would have impact if you could solve it, and I had an approach. Perfect, that's exactly what I was looking for. So I started to look in these areas. So to give a picture of that decade very quickly, um, in 59, I set out to discover the principles of data networks. I published a proposal in early 61, developed the mathematical theory of data networks, introduced the concept of packet switching and analysis. I followed the citation at the end of 1962. They decided to make a book out of it. I immediately joined UCLA faculty. Uh, we'll go through some of the details right now to pick up some of the technology for those ACM technology people in the audience. This is a picture of my thesis proposal. It was submitted and accepted in July of 20, 1961. The title is interesting. It was called Information Flow in Large Communication Nets. I was heavily influenced by Claude Shannon, who saw that when you take a large number of elements and mix them, properties emerge that you wouldn't see in smaller systems. So I decided to look at large systems. And here is the opening page of my proposal. And it addressed the following. It said, look, we're going to look into large networks. It's going to consist of nodes and links that sorts, receive, transmit, sort. They enter and leave via the links. We're going to ask for the response time. What about the capacity? What's the storage capacity you need? What routing discipline should we use? Queuing discipline. When does it jam up? What's the transient behavior? And on and on with all of these things. And the problem that was trying to face was the following. Voice traffic is very different from data traffic. With voice traffic, you dedicate a pipe to a conversation for the entire duration of that conversation, even though occasionally we stop speaking, as I just did. We're silent roughly one third of the time in a duplex channel. As it turns out, data traffic is not at all like that. It's highly bursty, it's silent most of the time. Imagine whacking a keyboard over a gigabit channel, that channel is almost always sending nothing. And since data channels are expensive, we couldn't afford to permanently assign a dedicated pipe to data. So what's the solution? Solution is the following. Dynamically share the resources, namely don't assign a resource, a pipe, a channel to traffic that's not yet there. When you need it, you'll get it. When you're done, let go of it, let somebody else use it. Dynamically share the resources on a demand basis. Now that was already being done in time sharing systems in the late 50s and early 60s. They were sharing basically computer resources, that computing capability, many people sharing on an as you needed demand basis. So I figured out why not do the same thing with the channel capacities of communication networks. Similar picture, those red resources will only be used when there's data there to be sent. And that was the idea of using dynamic resource sharing. 
basically, I set up the analytical model, um, used queuing theory, used that, recognized that was the tool to be used, solved the model. Once you can solve it, you can optimize it. I optimized the capacity assignment, the topology, the routing procedures, sort and introduced dynamic adaptive routing control, looked at different queuing disciplines, among which was basically taking long messages and chopping up into fixed length segments, which we later call packets. And I talked about analyzing that. And basically then looked at the underlying principles of all of this. Even though you could solve it and optimize it, what were the principles that were being exposed that you could use in other systems? So if you look at this, an early model I put up was a picture like this, which said basically you chop something it's fixed like length pieces and ship them one at a time. And the analysis came up with that equation, which was the, an exact equation for the response time of packetized messages. And it basically showed one of the key principles of uh, packetization, namely that long messages don't mind being bumped by very short messages, but the reverse is absolutely not true. You don't want a short message to wait a long time for a long message. So get, let little guys get in first, they'll filter through with the small interference of the big guys. That's one of the main advantages of package switching. So continuing, basically look at a more general network, you want some things out of this network. You want the response time, what we call the average network delay. You have to know the traffic on each channel. You need to know the throughput the network is trying to provide. And you need to know how long it takes to move over this little blue channel. In terms of those four numbers, you can write down the following equation, which I did. This was the key equation for network response time, the mean network response time. And the interesting thing, it not only is it simple, it's exact. There are no approximations here. And so it would basically opened up the ability to analyze these networks. Basically from that, you can do some optimal network design, you can optimize the capacity, et cetera. How much capacity to put in each channel if you have a fixed amount of capacity to, to share a main network, that's the answer. If you do that, you then want to assign that capacity and you find that the optimal response time is given by this formula. So the point is the analysis is going forward. It exposed some principles. First principles are already mentioned, dynamic resource sharing, only assign a resource to data or needs that are present. And there's many ways to do that. Message switching is one, polling, you ask, if somebody needs it, you give it. If they don't need it, you pass them by and move on. Asynchronous time division multiplexing and packet switching. But recognize, and it's important, packet switching is only one way to get the main principle, number one, namely the idea of dynamic resource sharing. Another thing that came out was an economy of scale. It turns out if you scale up the throughput and the capacity of a network of any queuing system, you get much better performance. You can improve the response time. You can improve the efficiency, improve the throughput all simultaneously. And third, the idea of adaptive dynamic routing basically to show that it was efficient, stable, robust, and it works. And those are the kind of underlying principles that you come out when you do an analysis like this. So these threads of inquiry were emerging. This is while ARPA grew, as I say, in this period, ARPA was formed in 1958. There was this research community that I started to describe to you that was generating the underpinnings of the technology. The there were three efforts. The first one I just talked about, the one that I was involved with, the MIT thread. And again, the thesis proposal in early 61, the paper on packetization in April 62, the dissertation by the end of 62. But meanwhile, there was another independent thread of research at the Rand Corporation by Paul Barron. He also was talking about and looking at packet switching and the structure of networks. And he was concerned more with the end-to-end -end behavior and the architecture of these networks. And he published his paper on this hot potato routing in September 62, we did introduce the idea of using the Dijkstra algorithm for updating the routing behavior, the path lengths and the, the optimal paths as you move along. And in, in August of 64, he published a multi-volume uh, group on a lot of his research. So that's the second independent thread. The third thread, was out of England, the National Physical Laboratory, Donald Davies, 
he was looking more at the engineering aspect. He started looking at this in 1966 in terms of publishing it. And in the late 60s, early 70s, he actually created the first packet switch before ARPA and the United States did, but it was only a one node network. And a one node network does not a network make. So he didn't get the funding to make a bigger network. So these are the theoretical threads, the mathematical threads, if you will. And the interesting thing is that the theory behind what the internet would, how it would perform was worked out before it was deployed and implemented, which is not always the case. And happily that was the case here. Um, but nobody in the telecommunication industry cared. In the 60s, when this came out, nobody was interested. But ARPA, which now is moving along, was posed to take this work and implement it into a deployed network. So let's look at the second thread I talked about, the government thread. ARPA steps in. Licklider, who I referred to before as the, that, the man computer symbiosis, he headed up ARPA's computer group starting up in 1962. He was succeeded two years later by one of my MIT classmates, Ivan Sutherland. Sutherland came to UCLA and said, look, you have a theory for making a network. You have three identical IBM configurations. Put them together and make a network. And the technology was clearly available and ready to go, but it never happened. And it never happened because of bureaucratic infighting. People couldn't agree to put their computers on a shared network. By 1966, Taylor succeeded to Sutherland. And by then there were a lot of research groups around the country who were providing enormous capability at their local site. And Taylor said, look, let's network these computers together so they can share their resources. So we hired Larry Roberts, another classmate of mine, as chief scientist in 1966 to build that network. So now we had merged the theory and the government threads and ready to go. Larry himself was aware of my MIT research. He in fact was an office mate of mine. So we knew there was a theory and he recognized that we were able to prove that the packets wouldn't fall on the floor. And so he could spend these millions to create this network and off we went. So the beginning. In 67, a group of ARPA researchers got together to create a spec. We wrote the spec, sent it out to industry, asked the industry to bid. By the end of 68, ARPA accepted a contract from a company in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Bolt, Baranek and Newman. They won the contract. It was their job to deploy a network and send the first node out to UCLA by September of 1969. UCLA was chosen to be the first node because they had this research group going and the technology to understand the way they should perform. On July 3rd, before the network was deployed, UCLA put out a press release. There it is. Came out basically in July of 1969. And at the end of it, on the second page, there's a direct quote. This is, was my vision at that point is what the network would look like. It said, as of now, computer network is still in their infancy. But as they grow up, and become more sophisticated, we'll probably see the spread of computer utilities, what we call those things web-based IP services today, which like present electric and telephone utilities, well, that's an always on invisible technology, will service individual homes and offices across the country, a ubiquitous service. So this vision was fairly prophetic but it totally missed the idea of social networking. The fact this was not about computers talking to each other. It was about people communicating. And I didn't realize that until email came in in 1972. One aspect of this vision, which is still not been realized is this, this idea of invisibility that the network should be everywhere and embedded and disappear into the infrastructure. We'll talk about that in just a moment. By 69, the first router appeared at UCLA. In October 29th, the first message was sent from UCLA to Stanford Research Institute. So what did it look like in that period? Well, before 69, UCLA had its host computer where I was running the time shared service for the computer science department. And in September 69, that first switch arrived that we would now call a router, the first interface message processor. That's what it looks like, telephone booth side device. That's imp number one you're looking at, still exists at UCLA. That's the control panel. That's what the inside looks like. It's quite beautiful, if you will. It's so ugly, it's beautiful. That was the first host and the first router, the first imp. 
In October the 2nd, router appeared up at Stanford Research Institute, 350 miles to the north. They got the second imp, they connected their host. And that red line is the first piece of the backbone network ever deployed. It was deployed in October of 1969, and it was running the blazing speed of 50,000 bits per second. Today, that's a joke. In those days, that was glorious. It was broadband. So we decided to keep a log. So we stole one of the notebooks from the uh, host computer at UCLA, started in October 69 to keep a log. And the most important entry in that log is this one. On October 29th, 1969, at 10.30 at night, Charlie Klein, my programmer, wrote into the log and he said, talk to SRI host to host. That is the only record of the first message ever on the internet. There was no camera, no voice recording, only an entry in a funny little logbook. And the setup was this, UCLA's host computer, our switch, the high-speed line, second switch, and SRI's host. That was the first message of the internet. But what was that first message? Was it something really good, like Samuel Morse, what hath God wrought? Well, how about with Alexander Graham Bell? Watson, come here, I need you. Or Neil Armstrong, one giant leap for mankind. Those guys were smart. They understood the public relation, the press, the media. We were not at all sophisticated. All we wanted to do was log in. We didn't have a good message. And to log in, you have to type L-O-G, and the remote computer will know what you do and it'll type the I-N for you. So here we go, ready to do our dumb little message. But the idea is to log in remotely to prove the way this network should perform, which means you sit at one machine, you use the network to log into a remote machine and use its services remotely. So to log in, you get that capability. So here we go. That's the setup. And Charlie is down here at UCLA, Bill Duval up here at SRI, and we put a telephone connection between the two just to make sure we knew what was going on. And the irony here is that we're using the telephone network to deploy a new networking technology, which will destroy the telephone network. But there we were. So we sent the L, and Charlie said, you get the L? And Bill said, yep, got the L. And an L printed on Charlie's terminal. We sent an O, he said, you get the O? Yep, got the O, the O printed. Sent the G, you get the G? Crash. So the first message ever on the internet was low. Very simple profound prophetic message. I expanded a little bit later on and said that it's lo and behold, a more prophetic, more profound, more succinct message we could not have asked for and it was by accident. But now you know, first message was low, October 29th, 1969, 10.30 at night at UCLA, from UCLA up to SRI. So that's now a documentary movie by Werner Herzog. It's available on Netflix, you can find it there. And I'm going to show you the opening scene from that network, from that movie. And here it is. Let's enter this very special place. That machine over there is the first piece of internet equipment. This is a military hardened machine. It has a unique odor. And it was from here that the first message was sent. A revolution began. So that's the way it began. And so what happened after that? Well, we were young engineers working at the time. We didn't know any better. So we launched enough to do what hadn't been done before, to create this new technology, to create a research network and do the engineering for it. We had a model, we had analyzed it, we knew how it should behave, but we were engineers. And we also know what we didn't know. We knew that we had to experiment with this thing to see how it really worked and define things we hadn't anticipated. So that's a very important message for the entire audience here, all of you ACM members. So let's watch the growth of the internet. From 1969, from when it began, when it looked like that, it was originally two, three, four node network, until 1988, when it grew across the country early on, a rather large network, it basically grew very fast in a very friendly way, very ethical way, broadly until 1988. 
a graduate student unleashed the first internet worm, a virus, and it hit about 10% of the computers on the network. And we said, ouch, we said, uh-oh, what's going on here? But then we thought about it and we say, eh, it's an aberration, don't worry about it. Big mistake. We should have been much more aware of this problem. So from 88, it continued to grow. Dot coms came online. The backbone went to gigabit speeds, thanks to Al Gore, the information superhighway. The web began to roll out until 1994. Two attorneys introduced broad-based spam on our message, on our network. And we said, uh-oh, and this time we said, ouch. We complained to these guys. We sent email back to them and said, you can't do this. What is it they did? Well, if you haven't seen the first spam message, here it is. Sent out on April 12th, 1994. It said, there's a green card lottery. And if you come to us and pay us, we'll help you get in that lottery. They were advertising on our research network. How dare they? As I say, we complained. We sent email back to them. We said, stop, cease and desist, shame on you. Don't do this. We sent so much email back to them, we took down their server. So as an unattended consequence of the first spam message, we created first denial service attack. Unintended, but there we are. Well, this basically ushered in the dark side. Basically the dark side developed. It includes all the things you know about, all the bad stuff you are subject to now. And the enablers for the internet, not only the dark side, but for the internet, what, what enables the internet so powerfully? Allows anybody in a basement with a computer and internet access to reach hundreds of millions of users easily, instantly, at no cost in money or effort, anonymously. That in some sense is the power of the network. And it's also a perfect formula for the dark side. Well, a tipping point occurred. In those early days, we had no interest in patenting or IP, intellectual property or private ownership. We just was doing this thing for the challenge. We were a bunch of nerds doing this. We're creating new technology, a new world. But in 1994, when that first message, that first spam message appeared, it changed quickly. The World Wide Web became a household presence. Some major sites appeared. What happened to the early internet that I knew? Well, our wonderful creation that could do this magnificent services suddenly ended up being sold, being used to sell detergent. 50 million users worldwide at that time and the commercial world recognized immediately, wow, this is a powerful shopping machine. It's not a research engine. It's a gossip chamber. It's an entertainment channel. It's a social club. And so it became a money-making machine and took a serious left turn. It went not only for being a nuisance of hackers that I mentioned before, like a teenager, but now we have serious and dangerous players, nation states. Look what's happening in the world today, organized crime. So if you look at the people who brought all this to us, let's go over that. There were the early pioneers. I've mentioned all their names already. There were the implementers who deployed some of the early technology, the people who added services, the launches of the big apps, and finally the billionaires. Time is going down the page. It took over 20 years for those billionaires to appear, but they did. But the question is, were these people necessary? Question is, the answer is the internet would have emerged if none of those people were born. We were lucky, we were there at the right time. This was in the air. Tesla already told us about it. And so did many other visionaries. As I said, it was waiting for technology to catch up with the vision. So the next phases of the internet infrastructure will be of course, nomadic computing, ubiquity, mobility, blockchain, distributed ledgers, IOT, software agents, invisibility. And in fact, invisibility is an important thing as I mentioned before. The internet should be as simple and convenient to use as is electricity. Electricity is a couple of holes in the wall. You plug in, you get electricity. There's no complicated interface. There's no login. There's no nothing. Just get it. It's not the case today. It's not as simple as that. When I walk into a room, the room should know I'm there. It should provide to me all my services that I want. 
and it should be able to interact with the systems using human communication, speech, gestures, haptics, even a brain computer interface perhaps. The invisibility is not yet there. But if you wanna ask what's gonna happen, the infrastructure is easy to predict. Nomadic computing is coming, it's come. Ubiquitous computing, intelligent software agents, embedded technology, intelligent devices, smart spaces, internet of things, virtual augmented reality. All of that's been happening. The internet in fact will be a pervasive global nervous system. That ladies and gentlemen is the infrastructure. If you ask about the applications and services, sorry, not easy to predict, very difficult to predict. We have failed at every fork in the road where these things have appeared. Let me show you some of them that we didn't anticipate. And it constantly surprises us. We didn't anticipate email, the web, peer to peer file sharing, blogs, user generated content, search engine dominance, shopping engines, social networking, distributed ledgers, blockchains, cryptocurrency, reputation systems, circles of trust, expert curation. All these things came out of the blue, suddenly, unanticipated, explosive. So what have we done? We have created a global system for constantly shocking us with surprises, and that's a good thing. That means there's opportunity there for new apps and services and technology to be deployed and contribute. So basically, right now, we've created a new laboratory at UCLA called the UCLA Connection Lab to shape the future and basically bring about that same kind of world we wanted before, but replicate the environment that led to the internet. So we've come a long way, or have we? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kleinrock, for that informative and interesting talk. Like I said, he's a great storyteller, um, and I love when he tells that story about uh, first message on the internet. Um, we uh, have some time to take some questions, and so if there's questions in the room, we'll take them. Also, there's some questions on chat. So um, I'll start with a, a question from chat, and I'll kind of work backwards through here. So the first question was about the um, internet worm that, was, um, that you talked about. Um, and the question was, was that unleashed intentionally or unintentionally? That's a good question, and it's a controversy. Um, the, Robert Morris claims he didn't mean to release it. He says basically his, his roommate did. Um, it's not clear. But what's interesting is his father worked for the NSA at the time, and his father said it's a good thing. And at the time when we heard the father saying that, we said, what are you talking about? That's not a good thing. You've annoyed the internet. The fact is he was basically, un perhaps unwittingly, warning us about the future to come and the bad side of this network. So the answer is, the claim is it wasn't released intentionally. Was it? Ask Robert Morris. Got it. Thank you. We've got another question here on the chat log. Uh, and the question is, what was used to carry the data signal from UCLA to SRI? Good question. We took AT&T long lines. They had basically, it was a digital network at the time, we're sending data. And we removed their circuit switches and we put in our packet switches, those imps. And so we're using ATT infrastructure but our switches to send the message. It was basically using a new tariff called the Telpac tariff. And we, we were ganging together a bunch of 4.8 kilobit per second lines to get the 50 kilobit per second line. And it was 50 kilobits per second, not 56, which was the standard a little bit later. Thank you. Um, I see two other questions here on the chat. Um, and let me know when we, right. Okay, um, there's a question about, uh, I guess you talked about there were a number of uh, other organizations, collaborators and um, organizations and people involved with the, out, the, the rollout of the internet. Uh, so the question is, what was the role and contribution of the University of Illinois? So University of Illinois was one of the early sites that ARPA began to fund when it first got formed. Um, they had high performance computing capability. 
And their supercomputers were of interest to the rest of us. So they made their services available as a, as a service, but not particularly on the underlying network infrastructure. They were one of the early sites to come on. Um, and that was one of the reasons that Bob Taylor recognized he wanted to put computers on the network. There were, University of Utah had excellent graphics. SRI had great database. Um, UCLA had simulation. Illinois had high performance computing. And so those are the kinds of things that basically convinced Bob Taylor, let's create this network. Awesome. All right, um, and I have a question one. here. Oh, we have a question from the, from the room. All right, question from the room. Yeah, uh, this is Wale Akinpelu. I want to follow up on the link between SRI and UCLA. Did you have a modem in front of your terminals? And did you design the modems or was that designed by the carrier? Okay. The setup was our programmer sat at a terminal connected to our timeshare computer, just like a regular terminal. That host computer was connected to the imp with a cable and the imp itself had modems designed to talk to those high speed lines. The imp itself was the packet switch and it had to design its own modems, its own protocols, its own software. So we weren't using ATT modems, we were using our own modems to interface with the line interfaces that ATT provided. I have a question um, from, um, oh, this is uh, uh, from the chat. The question is, how do you feel IPv6 reflects the original spirit of the internet? Well, you could say the same thing about IPv4 or IP in general. The spirit of the internet was, I said, open, shared, flexible, free, et cetera. The IP world, the internet, TCP and IP allowed multiple networks to interact. And that was the contribution of that, that particular protocol pair. IP was the underlying hop by hop transmission within a network. TCP was end to end across gateways that allowed different networks to connect to. Um, does it, it, you can't argue that the TCP IP uh, or even the early network control protocol uh, was instantiating the vision. The vision was to allow people to talk to computers and computers to talk to computers. The network allowed that. The protocols made it, enabled it. But the idea of introducing layered protocols on top of the infrastructure was very important. And in that sense, uh, TCP and IPv4 and 6. But IPv6 introduced some more security. It introduced a larger namespace. It introduced other functionality. But uh, I wouldn't single out IPv6 as, as, as a critical step. And in fact, it's not been all that well deployed at this point as well. TCP IP was a very significant contribution to allow internet working taking place. Hey, we've got a question from the room. Yeah, uh, Professor Kleindruck, interesting talk to see the history of internet. This is Ashutosh Datta from Johns Hopkins, Applied Physics Lab. So the question here is 50 years back or more than 50 years back when internet was born, uh, did you anticipate how it's going to look like 50 years from then? And has it, has it, has it met your expectation, uh, the evolution of internet, what has happened as of today? Great question. I covered some of that. I did have a vision where I talked about uh, the ubiquity, the uh, IP services, and I talked about the invisibility. Um, I, it has not yet achieved the invisibility, as I said toward the end of my talk, but I totally missed, as I said, the social networking side. Uh, it, it, capped, it, it caught up to that very quickly with the introduction of email, but there was a vision and much of it has been appreciated, but now with IoT and intelligent software agents, we're beginning to see the, the, basically the capability disappear into the infrastructure into the embedded technology in our walls, our fingers, our cars, our homes, et cetera. Um, so I had the vision, so did others. As I say, Tesla had this magnificent vision. He had most of it in mind. He didn't mention video because there was no video at the time. Um, 
So the answer is yes, I had a vision. A lot of it's been, been implemented. Some I missed and some has not yet occurred. Okay, we've got um, two more questions here. I think we can get to. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, do you see the internet to be, continue to be a best be a best effort internet for all services and thus compromising QoS? Or do you see the internet going to logical internets through slicing to support multiple quality of service for a variety of applications and data types? So I, I see a mix. Question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see a mix. Clearly, there's a, there's a need for both of those. The um, we're really addressing some of the issues of the um, the open internet, if you will, um, net equity, if you will. Um, the the ability to differentiate service on a cost basis is interesting, but it does interfere with young startups getting started up and being disadvantaged at the pricing level and the access level. So I believe there's a need for both net neutrality. Um, I see there's a, a, a chat question coming up on that right now. I believe in net neutrality. I believe it's important. I don't want to see the bigger organizations squash the small ones. And we're seeing a real problem today in uh, you know, the, the giants taking over and, and not making it possible for the new startups to get in. And it's done by pricing, it's done by, uh, uh, by selection, by favoritism, it's done by what's presented to the user, it's done by pricing, and it's done by uh, uh, the way in which they deal with your privacy issues. So I am a strong supporter of net neutrality. And uh, yet I can see that if there's an organization that wants a private network to support a particular application, they will do that whether or not we allow it. They, they can make that happen. But what I don't want to see happen is the move that's occurring, not so much from a financial point of view, but from a political point of view, and that is the balkanization of the network, the splinter of the network, where for privacy reasons and, 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 and um, uh, governmental jealousy reasons, governments are putting walls around their country's networks. They can turn them on and off. They can decide what comes in and goes out. And once you do that and you get a balkanized network, you've lost the magnificence of the internet, which is a worldwide network. If you fractionate it, you don't get the full access. You've lost a lot of the capability and if you will, the dream and the goal of the original internet. Thank you. And you know, I, we have one last question, which I think is a great follow-up to that. And uh, so the question is, what is the next significant internet related technology development that you are most interested in? Well, I'm following a few. Clearly, quantum computing is a fascinating area which comes and goes as elusive and not, but it certainly offers some, some intriguing capabilities. The whole metaverse is another world we're looking at, um, which brings up the issue of a blockchain, which is a kind of virtual world in which a lot of this takes place. I believe blockchain and the whole distributed ledger world is a significant development. Uh, I know there's a lot of controversy over whether it's, if it's a flash in the pan, whether it's corrupt or whether it's gonna stick. The trouble with blockchain is the following. People like to compare it to the growth, to the importance of the internet. The internet, as I pointed out, had 20 years, 25 years to be curated by engineers, by applications, before the money question came in, before the profit motive came in. And so it could protect itself against some of the abuses we're seeing today. Blockchain came out of the gates with a dollar sign in its mouth. And it very quickly went into the world of finance and corruption and fraud and all the rest. Notwithstanding the fact that it's a fantastic technology with enormous promise yet to be realized. So in answer to the question, I see blockchain as one of the really important um, developments of the future awesome. and a distributed ledger in particular. Awesome. Well, well thank you, uh, Professor Kleinrock. We had a few other questions, but we're running, we're running short on time. And so there are a few questions in the chat. If, Professor Kleinrock, if you, if you um, wanted to respond to those questions, you can. If not, we understand, but we have these questions um, uh, and sorry, uh, we, we ran out of time. Uh, 
in, in recognition you. of you uh, giving this talk today, we want to show our appreciation to you and our thanks. And we're going to do this that um, through this plaque that we're going to be um, virtually presenting today, but sending out a physical plaque to you. And it reads, um, the ACM Baltimore chapter extends its appreciation to Professor Leonard Kleinrock for delivering the inaugural invited talk for the ACM Baltimore chapter uh, seminar for 2022, uh, Laurel, Maryland, February 24th, 2022. And again, thank you, Professor Kleinbrock, for that um, interesting and invigorating and insightful talk. I, I, I know I learned a lot, and I would imagine a lot of people learned a lot about, about how the internet actually developed. Um, and lo and behold, now we have this great thing. So thank you. Let's- My, my pleasure, my <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Um, at this point, we're going to have a quick break, five-minute break, and then the, our next speaker is going to be Dr. April Erickson from, from NASA. So our second speaker for the evening is going to be Dr. April Erickson. Dr. April Erickson has held numerous positions during her 27-plus year tenure with NASA. In 2017, Dr. April Erickson assumed the position of new business lead for the NASA Goddard Space Space Flight Center, Instrument Systems and Technology Division. Formerly, she served as the deputy to the chief technologist for the Engineering and Technology Directorate with a focus on CubeSat and SmallSat mission development. She has also served at NASA HQs as a program executive for the Earth Science and a business executive for the Space Science. Some of the most prestigious awards that she's had are from, uh, some of the most prestigious are from the Western Society of Engineers, the 2016 Washington Award, and the Engineering Honor Society. Tau Beta Pi, um, distinguished alumnus. She is proud to be the first African-American female to receive a PhD in mechanical engineering from Howard University the first American to receive a PhD in mechanical engineering, the first American female to receive a PhD in mechanical engineering, and the, the aerospace option from HU, and the first African American uh, female to receive a PhD in engineering at NASA Goddard, Goddard Space uh, Center. Um, and so I have the high honor of presenting Dr. Erickson. I uh, actually, uh, on, a, on a personal note, remember Dr. Erickson. We both were at Howard University at the same time, and I remember her working on her PhD while she was at Howard. Um, and I will say that watching her go through that was part of the motivation that got me to the point where I eventually got, got my doctorate. So thank you for that motivation, Dr. Erickson. The next voice that you're going to hear is Dr. April Erickson. Oh, thank you so much for that great introduction. And I should say, um, Leonard, I'm actually an MIT alum. So um, I share something with both of you guys on the screen at the moment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So hopefully this will work seamlessly. OK, so um, thank you for having me today. Uh, this is the first time I've had the opportunity to interact with the Association for Computing Machinery. Um, but I thank you for making the time to listen to my talk. I just wanted to highlight that when Jeff asked me, um, it, it actually happens that I'm also the top recipient. I received the top award from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers this year. Um, it's called the Rob, Ralph Coates Row Award. Um, and I like to say it comes with a little ching ching and a little bling bling. So us Federal employees don't always get to accept monetary awards, but I'll be able to accept this one. Um, as a result, <laughs> my dance card is quite full. Um, and so I decided that this might be ac actually something you guys would be interested in hearing. And then if we have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, LunaNet, which is the envisioned internet for lunar space, you know, for to, to probably coincide with the Artemis program. So one of the things that really touched me about this time that we're going through and, and uh, when things are difficult, I look for inspiration. Um, considering it's Black History Month, I figured it'd take a moment to um, really celebrate our past. As John F. Kennedy says here, we celebrate the past to awaken the future. For me, 
um, as a young lady, and I see my, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, the things that inspired me were the Apollo missions. You know, I was this first grader that was very fortunate that a parent brought a TV to the school so that we could all crowd around this little black and white TV. Yeah, I'm dating myself. And I was really, truly inspired by the space program. I must say at that time, I thought um, that the astronauts were pretty old because to a sixth grader, men in their thirties seemed pretty old. Um, I quickly did that math, right? And then I figured out how old they were and we all were kind of saying, well, gee, you know, I hope I don't have to be that old. I'm gonna be much younger. Um, and I have applied to the astronaut program, but there were things actually medically that held me back from getting selected. And since we are talking about computing, I said, what not better than to highlight um, one of my former mentors and a shiro for me, which was described as a hidden figure in that very infamous movie that we so loved, many of us love to see, um, Catherine G. Johnson, and G is for Goebel. Um, I love to talk about the fact that she was a math teacher first from West Virginia, and uh, she was able to solve orbital navigation equations for Gemini and Apollo missions. And she is really all about computer science, right? Because the things that she was doing at the time, the women were labeled human computers. And so I thought this was just most appropriate to highlight someone like her for your meeting. Um, I will note that the night that she was receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Barack Obama, we were supposed to get together, but it had been such a long day for her. Um, and her, her daughter, Joelle, and I um, still maintain contact with Joelle and I discussed it and we just thought it'd be too much to try to bring the family over. So I didn't get her to see her that day, but I'm really I'm just always so proud of the things that she was able to contribute. So with COVID, you know, I think a lot of us have been very determined and I say, you know, grit, even in the face of failure, but you know, with COVID, we could not fail. Um, I think of myself as a kid, you know, this little brown girl who grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, New York, and I was a Tom girl. As you can see, Don, I look a little rough and tough here. Um, you know, got the little baseball bat going on. And believe it or not, even though I, my mother um, argued for me to be on the baseball team, I never got to play. I sat on the bench and watched, and the same thing happened with basketball because it just didn't let girls do that kind of stuff. But I was one of those kids that was determined and so there you go, you can see me playing all kinds of sports. I'm actually an athlete um, and I'm an aging athlete, but um, even as recent as this past year, I was awarded um, MVP for Washington DC co-ed softball champs. Um, I believe that you know you, there's a lot to be said with learning how to work with men. And so sports did that for me and it allowed me to really um, continue to have that grit to succeed in the face of the fact that I'm in a field that is dominated by men. Um, I did graduate from MIT the year of the shuttle disaster, and it really made me decide on what path I would take for the future. And I think it did that the same thing. There was a, a bit of reckoning at that moment of what we were going to do with our space program after the first shuttle disaster. For myself, I really didn't want to work in missile defense. And um, I was extremely interested in manned spaceflight. But as I mentioned at that time, after a failure like that, we were actually um, in a holding pattern for manned spaceflight. So I began to think about what other areas I could apply my aerospace knowledge to. Um, and as you can see, I've been very successful with multiple um, appointments. Not only have I been a full practicing engineer at Goddard, um, I've been a professor at Bowie State, Howard University and University of Maryland. I also have taught at a middle school. I used to teach aerospace club at middle school and I run um, a Nesby junior chapter. You'll hear about that, Nesby National Society of Black Engineers. Um, so I really think I'm a well-rounded engineer, technologist, um, my current, title is new business lead for the instrument systems and technology division. Um, I was a project manager for a number of missions, program manager, and I used to run the SBIR program um, at Goddard as well. So I've done quite a number of different things. Um, and in terms of my, my um, personality, I had to be somewhat competitive. And I always say to 
to people that are not quite like myself, don't hate the game, change the game, innovate and be a risk taker. And for me to step out of my comfort zone and to be an engineer, a professor, a manager, and then a mom, um, you know, really requires that I call it steam girl magic. And uh, I really believe that I had, could have something to contribute. And I think that everyone does to the things that we're trying to solve here. So remember that there is always a higher calling for tribute to something bigger. And I love the statement by John F. Kennedy, which kind of gets me into the mood for what I'm gonna talk about. But together, let us explore the stars, conquer the deserts, eradicate disease, tap the ocean depths and encourage the, the arts and commerce. And so I don't just say STEM when I go out to talk to kids, a lot of times I talk about STEAM. And as you can see, he's wrapped that all up into his, um, his statement. Um, lastly, as the instrument systems and technology division business, new business person, it's very different from the typical new business that, I mean, business that we think from a industry perspective, you know, working for the government, it's really about, um, finding partnerships, working proposals, new technology, infusing that technology and finding ways to collaborate with universities, academia, and industry. So if any of you are interested in collaborating with Goddard and particularly with our instrument technology, then I'm the person to come to and we can definitely talk and chat about how we can collaborate. So I'm, I'm thinking that many of you are familiar with Goddard and one of the things that we lead in is really the discussion of earth science and how our earth and the climate around us is changing. Um, I was very fortunate to work on not only ISAT 1 as a program exec, but later as the instrument manager for ISAT 2, um, which was you know, a $500 million instrument on a billion dollar project, um, mission. So it was something that I felt near and dear to my heart because you know, we have to solve these really big problems of climate change. And this allows us to really have the scrutiny and level of, um, of data to, to the resolution of um, three centimeters. We're able to measure um, many of the lasers with laser LIDAR technology. One of my favorite missions, um, Lola, was able to, to really be that advancement of that technology. And then ISAT takes it a step further with, you know, the six beams three tracks, six beams, um, and capable of not only measuring the glaciers, but also measuring sea ice um, and below the surface as well. So as we begin to think about the impacts and how we solve these problems, it really takes investigation of scientists all over the world, which really begins to talk about collaboration and working together. Um, as, as it's already been said by John F. Kennedy, you know, we really do have to work together. And COVID really forced us into that thought pattern because everybody in this entire world was quickly affected by COVID. But the one thing that was so inspirational is how we came together, how we come up with a global solution. And the White House Chief of Staff here has this comment, global solution to COVID insight. We sink or we swing, swim together. And I, I wish so often that we can put our differences aside and work together, I think it's so important for the future. Um, one of my statements that I like to say often is when diverse ideas collide, they spark innovation. Um, I think about this book that was written that talks about how a gentleman um, reflected on the six major inventions across, you know, across time. And believe it or not, he identified something as simple as um, tea and coffee houses. And why? Because at the time when the London first tea house was developed, it allowed people to have a beverage, sit down together and talk and chat from all walks of life. Um, they no longer needed to be inebriated to safely drink a beverage. They could drink a hot beverage um, and, and chit chat about things that would not normally occur in their daily lives. So I say to you to think about how you can have those incidental moments to discuss and collide um, and 
come up with some synergistic idea from the differences that you both possess. When you look at the face of industry, um, I love how they are promoting diverse teams, you know, helping to identify leadership from wherever. And it's very important to have that welcoming environment. If we're going to be able to solve problems through innovation, you really must have the ability to look at the problem from various different ways. I've been very fortunate that, you know, being a, a manager as well as being an engineer, but also having an artistic side um, it has allowed me to really approach problems, but also to see through someone else's eyes what they're thinking as they begin to explain and how that actually can mesh with the ideas that we have. So the virtual disruption, the things that have changed across all of our lives, you know, social work, school. Um, for many of us, we've, you know, we're really meeting virtual. We're like this, we've got a hybrid meeting going on here. What's been phenomenal with watching my daughter is that her trying to do math without a pen, pencil, or paper. I'm like, kid, how are you gonna do it? You know, how are you gonna do algebra one and geometry without a piece of paper and a pencil? But we're figuring it out. Um, all of the things that have now been sort of the societal norms of what we do and what we take to work have really changed. And it's really required us to think out the box. How do we make things fun and exciting and interesting on this two-dimensional platform that you're seeing right before you today? Um, so for me, even for my family, we started off with a virtual holiday party, right? And uh, we were able to bring so many more of us together across the country. And then the same thing happened in my job, right? So there I am with the team at the time, and we had a virtual party for our teams, um, really trying to also connect with people's you know, humanitarian side and having fun and feeling connected. Um, and then the virtual environment really strove to make change across the, the education um, platform. Um, it really required new approaches to teaching. You know, it, it changed how class time was spent. T students had to really own their own progress. Um, very challenging for younger students. Um, MIT did some really great things. I sit on um, a board at MIT and we discussed how they were really making intentional learning group assignments for students. You know, in the past, when you were at MIT, you typically, you know, would meet your classmates in class, but now they were really making sort of assignments to make sure that students were able to collaborate and talk together and to get that added support from each other. And then even things like college recruitment as well as employment recruitment have changed. You know, we're using a lot more of interviewing platforms um, and a virtual platform as well. And by the way, of course, all of this occurs because we've got um, great computer scientists or um, programmers that are able to create these platforms for us. For an organization like American Society of Mechanical Engineers, they really went to this you know, eFest digital learning. Um, they were able to actually ser service more students um, across the various countries. Um, and then they began to collaborate with governmental agencies and um, nonprofits to start to gather their manufacturing capabilities, the 3D printing capabilities um, that could be utilized by healthcare or others and to create this exchange um, network. And then this last bullet here about, you know, ASME learning from home, um, really creating a series of e-learning courses. Now, this had already been happening. I've been, you know, MIT was actually one of the leaders in putting their curriculum out there in a, an e-format. Um, but this became more prevalent, not only at university levels, but here we're talking about a professional society who began to really create this uh, coursework and, and availability to their their members. So another thing that occurred at MIT was they, they began to research and discuss how they were in the past had provided these online courses, but they also realized that they could not necessarily be the one that honchos the platform that would make it accessible and make it more palatable for people to use. So they, they did something unusual. They actually sold um, 
the, the, the particular part of edX, they became a public benefit company and they generally still turned that money back to a nonprofit, $800 million to actually help to strengthen the impact of digital learning. Um, and that was you know, a phenomenal step forward, but that was also one of their, their real focus for MIT and Harvard was to really to overcome uh, persistent inequities in online teaching and to make it accessible to others. For myself, I was in the middle of running a in-person um, Nesby Junior chapter. And uh, we won PCI chapter of the year, the previous year. And then all of a sudden things had to change. We have a code academy with Microsoft um, and we had to pivot really quickly to this virtual presence. And so the challenges were numerous for so many of us. How do we remain engage? How do students remain engaged? How do we all continue to innovate and learn in changing environments? Um, and this is my girl code team who eventually did so well considering this environment. Um, and I should have probably let it say because they call themselves girl code, which I thought was pretty relevant to the discussion here. But my girls are coding in first robotics and um, they were actually able to take the Nesby National Championship. They competed in Greece and uh, won awards in Greece. And so I say to adults, they're like, if the kids could do it, which we all know that kids are extremely tolerant and resilient, um, but if they can do it, we could too. So the successes during COVID-19 for NASA have been numerous. Um, you know, I'll start off with, again, you know, international partnerships are essential. And you could see that flavor again of us coming together. Um, you know, in the past, we had started off with, you know, very old and long ago talking about, you know, Mercury 13, in this case, women that were secretly trained. And now we're getting ready to, they did not end up going, this group did not end up going in space. But now we're talking about the Artemis program and NASA will land is, is planning on landing the first woman and the first person of color um, into uh, the, onto the moon's surface. And many of us are very excited about that, but it is really NASA pivoting also to collaborate with our commercial and international partners. Um, we really wanna see a sustainable um, opportunity for exploration to really grow in the future. And um, I, I'm so glad that they boldly took this challenge of you know, really diversifying the, the, the pool of candidates that have been on the surface of the moon. Um, and if we have time, I'll come back to Artemis pro program later. The other thing that we saw that was really a, a big stride forward was we began to see astronauts fly on commercial space vehicles. So here you see the SpaceX Crew-1 vehicle, and then it um, quickly pivoted to, you know, pretty much all private citizens commercial vehicle, um, I'll call the inspiration crew vehicle for, for four. And I, I believe I heard our previous speaker talking about the billionaires um, in, the, in, in, in the current industry. Well, here you go. This second flight was financed um, and uh, a number of people on that, of that second crew were paid for by, you know, a billionaire. So again, space is for everyone and uh, wanted to highlight this student run effort, which is about collecting messages around the world. Using nanotechnology, they actually etch onto a dish um, and that dish will be sent to the International Space Station. It's called the Humans Project and it's a chance for anyone to send a message into space. So I would say there is enough space for everyone. Some other things that have been really successful you know, we have Helios Physics with HERMS and Solaris. Those are some missions. Earth Science, we have the Suisar, um, which is uh, an instrument on board of the aircraft you see. And then Ice Cube is a little small CubeSat that was launched and able to get some phenomenal results re regarding um, the ice formation and clouds and things like that. For astrophysics, you guys have probably been following fairly closely the James Webb Space Telescope, um, which launched uh, back to the day before Christmas. And it is now 1.5 million kilometers away. It's parked in its orbit and it's fully deployed all of the mechanisms. I mean, just 
it's just been performing so wonderfully. We're all just tickled pink. Um, and I was fortunate to be the NearSpec Infrared Detector Manager for some time. Um, but the opportunity to see way back into time and to see the things that we have not been traditionally able to really see them in a timely manner is just is just phenomenal. We've already started to get data and pictures, and it's just a wonderful thing. And then we've got here Dragonfly, which is actually, oh, sorry. Dragonfly is actually a mission that we are partnering with APL with, um, but it's really it's a nuclear drone that we're going to have on um, uh, on a Martian surface, and it's an opportunity to again to explore in a different way. So for exploration for um, our robotics, we've continued to explore and to grow um, from some of the previous missions to Perseverance, and some of the things that were um, unique about Perseverance was that we actually carried two microphones on that um, device, on that robot. And um, it, there's a moment here that you can actually hear um, a helicopter flying. It may be a little difficulty, but ingenuity is also part of that package deal. And so we now have another uh, craft, not just a rover, but a helicopter flying on Mars. And then one of the biggest awesome type of, of if you're into orbital mechanics, um, maneuvering to actually land on Bennu, um, an asteroid, and to actually do what we call the tag, which is a touch and go. So we are able to actually touch down on the surface of Bennu, not just touch, but also um, collect samples into an, a vacuum-like um, apparatus and it's now on its way back um, from, from, you know, rendezvousing with Bennu. So really cool stuff. And you can see everybody's really happy. So that's OSIRIS-REx. So some other successes during COVID, and remember I was, at the time was talking about mechanical engineering, but ironically, many of these um, successes that I highlight are about data and about computing. And so you can see here this um, tunneler, which is a huge, it's a huge machine that does the tunneling to make um, break ground and do the large tunnels that we often really don't pay much attention to, but they're, they're done with the TBMs that are showing autonomously. And so one of the things that was done was actually they were able to successfully break ground with one of these huge tunneling mechanisms using autonomous an autonomous system, which had not done be, been done before. This um, the solution for it was an in-house tunnel insight solution, and it automatically generates predictive and prescriptive analytics and insights, um, really to help reduce any damage to the machinery, but also to hopefully predict unforeseen incidents that occur. And so you can see there with the brain and then machine learning, um, and then they've got the database. And so the, again, what we're starting to see too is really autonomy, artificial intelligence, and um, being integrated into various levels of our life. Um, this particular one is showing an innovative um, development that was funded by the Department of Energy. Um, it's a five and a half, almost $5.2 million grant that actually helps with the maintenance and predictive maintenance of nuclear power plants. And so this machine learn driven predictive maintenance could actually help with cost savings, but also help from potentially any damage to the machinery, which, you know, of course reduces time down, but they're using physics-based modeling um, in this machine learning uh, predictive uh, component. And so um, it, it, it allows us to have a flow loop that actually when, when actually the experimental flow loop that would use to emulate the cooling of this um, molten salt reactor. And then that way they can predict the, the, um, the performance in a way to actually avoid any failures. So I love the opportunity to look at new ways to apply 3D printing. My graduate degrees are in mechanical engineering. And 
one of the things that we don't often get to play with as much in the in the um, space environment was 3D printers. It's, it's actually slowly coming along because of the homogeneity of the material. You need to really make sure that you have that when you're looking at structures um, that potentially could fail in space. And so that has been slowly a thing that we've been utilizing um, across time. Um, close that door, Ariel. And so this gentleman here is actually able to print um, with the, the identification that looking at a lobster shell, he actually identified that lobster shells are not just this one thin sort of covered shell, it's actually multi-layered, thousands of little minuscule layers. And so he used that structure to actually begin to create his own um, 3D printed uh, concrete. And the innovation here was that it was used, using these tiny stretchable nanofibers inside the substance and then stack them similar to how you would um, see them in a lobster shell. Um, and this was done out of the um, Australian, he's a, he's a researcher in Melbourne, Australia. So moving again into the additive manufacturing and some of the other things that I think many of us had saw the, uh, the industry um, overwhelmingly coming together. I saw small businesses and large businesses coming together to help with the supply chain of uh, ventilators and um, masks for, for anyone in the healthcare industry. And so here I'm showing, you know, not a matter of fact, not only were it the shields, but also um, swabs because there was really a growing shortage quickly uh, for many of us that we're trying to find these supplies, you know, even for our households, but also for the hospitals. And then down at the bottom, it's actually showing um, some of the respirator designs that were created um, by the Czech Institute of Informatics and Robotics and Cybernetics. One of the things that HP did was they actually brought together communities to create a, a repository for these 3D files so that people could share them across the various industries. Again, the collaboration was just overwhelming during this period. Um, the other driving factor was not only to be able to protect ourselves with coverings or to be able to, you know, take um, lab tests, but then, of course, the disinfecting of environments and surfaces. And so these two particular um, devices we're showing here and an autonomous disinfecting robot. Um, which has the UV light that is a lot that allows you to actually kill the microbes. 99.9% um, effective. Um, this particular uh, device was actually developed here in the United States by Blue Ocean Robotics. And then many of us don't realize too that the, the HVAC filter systems also were a big concern that, you know, could the virus reside in those filters? And so this particular company actually designed a heated nickel foam air filter that would work at 99.8% efficiency, uh, proven to kill COVID and to of course reduce any other pathogens, um, airborne pathogens in residential or commercial areas. And then one other autonomous robot here, which you know, I would love to not have to get in my car and go out and get groceries and things like this, but this was a robot that would deliver groceries and parcels within a three mile radius. And again, just really helping to reduce the transmission. Um, and the last one here on the right is uh, really about guarding the gate. So I actually use this with my uh, Nesby Junior students when they come in the door, they stand up to this, this little, um, facial recognition thing is actually just looking for a face and then it measures temperature. It actually also checks to see if you have your mask on. The kids love it, of course, but I love it for a different reason to make sure that none of the kids are coming in with fevers or um, making sure that they're wearing their masks. So as we kind of move forward into the future, of course, I love to talk about how we really need to be inclusive and working together. Currently, you know, young students, they are in classes where their classmates are extremely diverse in culturally, um, in complexion, um, in capabilities, in terms of um, homes. So 
they're becoming used to it. And we as adults need to understand that this is the way of the future and we need to as well. I reflect on the things that I learned and the things that I watched as a child. You know, I was really uh, big into watching Star Trek. And many of us don't realize from, you know, this early generation of Star Trek, how diverse this crew was and that this was a vision that Carl Sagan um, talks about in terms of, you know, somewhere, somewhat thing incredible is waiting to be known. Um, but, you know, the, the producer at this time was really, in, really planting that seed that, that germinated over time to really understand that we could all work together. I believe that we all should be touching the future, inspiring the next generation, and hopefully the things that you're seeing here um, are inspirational to you, the things that we're able to collaborate. And, and for my um, colleague there who's from Howard, there you see me, I was actually on the board of trustees at that time, um, but I was able to then um, pivot and make a relationship with Oprah Winfrey and visit her school in South Africa and to, to listen to you know, women engineers who are striving to make change in their communities where they've not always been embraced, but how can you leave out 50% of the population, I ask. Um, so things that you might think about as you want to move forward into really helping your communities think about um, the rules of engagement. I must say that when I was asked um, yesterday during a, a fireside chat, you know, one of what are the things that I think most highly about, and I say integrity and honesty is, is truly one of the, the highest things in terms of values that I find for my teams. Transparency is really important. I'm gonna ask Jeff, how are we doing on time? Um, Jeff, are you there? Sorry, I don't move as fast as I used to. Um, okay. Yeah, we got, a, we got about um, a few minutes and then about five minutes for questions. So if you can, maybe about uh, two or three more minutes and then we'll get some questions. All right, I'm gonna pull up quickly another chart. I want to show colleagues here. Yeah. Wow, I lost my screen. There it is. Can you guys see the screen right now? Jeff, are you seeing this? And you're probably saying, I don't move as quickly as I did, right? <laughs> yes, we can see it. Okay. This is a shot snapshot of, um, that was taken in 2019. And I wanted to show people that there are, there are definitely places for um, people to collaborate with us at Goddard. Right now, it, it's estimated about $2 billion, the contributions um, for exploration. And I know that excites people quite a bit. Um, I'm going to move back just a little bit to the LunaNet um, conversation. Um, so some of the things that Goddard has been weighing heavily on is we talked about really about a woman being in space. And so we do wanna see that as the future. You can see that the communication that's necessary, the cross communication that's necessary if we're gonna be able to inhabit the moon. Um, this is showing like this is supposed to be a, a 4D <laughs> type resolution type picture of her boot um, and then being able to communicate with students across the world. And you can see here, you know, when we able to communicate you know, even be able to communicate in caverns beneath the surface um, the, of the moon. Um, and then how do we do this? Well, we've been building up cap capabilities and technologies. And if for many of you know that um, a large percentage of our workforce at Goddard are um, contractors. So we work very closely with industry, but we've been working on enabling um, technologies like robotic refueling missions and specialized tools and robots as you've seen and heard and avionics and even fluid transfer and cryogenic fluid transfer because if we were to have to refuel, um, it's typically gonna be with a very cold fuel. So cryogenic fueling is gonna be very important in the future. Of course, assembling in, in space, which is something I studied when I was at MIT and how do we do that? How do we train people to do that in a safe manner, um, manufacturing and minoring. So space communication is big and it was great to hear Leonard um, mention quantum communications and Goddard is actually um, working in that area. 
So anybody that's you know got something or wish or interested in that, um, and if you are in private industry, um, particularly small businesses, we do have uh, a spot in the call for small businesses, which includes quantum, quantum-like techniques, quantum communication, and quantum timing sensitive um, instrumentation. We will learn from all of the things that we've been doing with earth science as well as um, space weather. And so it's very important for us to understand the atmosphere um, from the sun. As we kind of move out, we have to be able to understand that that environment to be able to be predictive and to do space weathering modeling. And so that's an extremely important area and characteristic we believe for the future of, of, of our ability to travel in space. The, the CCMC, just if you want to know for um, your own information, Community Coordinated Modeling Center. So that's actually where we do a lot of this. And this knowledge would then be in conjunction with our Lunar Net Communications Network to help us predict any disturbances um, or to communicate directly to the Earth or the, the moon surface rather that something like a solar flare is occurring. And so we envision that, you know, astronauts would either have handheld devices, wrist devices or whatever, but they would be able to be warned of say a solar flare, um, you know, emitting those, the CMEs as we know in from the, um, in radiation from the uh, environment of the sun. Of course, understanding, I've already mentioned ISAT, um, JEDI is another mission, really understanding the, the ability to study the Earth, which leads us to really being able to have a sustained presence on the moon and Mars. And then looking at our planetary science contributions, you know, we've gained after decades of, you know, research on other bodies, planetary bodies, now to really explore and to go back and analyze like chemical constituents on Mars, with say, say the SAM instrument, or um, how, or the, how we have to have plans to even do more with our MoMA instruments. And then I already mentioned the recently selected um, Dragonfly mission. Well, actually, it's, I guess it's over a year now. Um, but that will actually assess micro, uh, microbial habil habit habitability and the prebiotic chemistry at various locations on Titan, so on, on the Titan moon. Um, we've had a numerous selections for many other instruments on the surface, um, looking particularly at lunar volatiles, um, space, um, looking at regoliths and the space economic resources, which of course is for the manufacturing. And then um, as you can see, laser and uh, lunar environment monitoring station, those will all be very helpful for in-situ measurements right there on the ground. For people that are interested in actually applying to these things for like Artemis, um, there is a program called NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Project. And so you can apply with your own proposals to um, enhance the capabilities and to fill the gaps that we see for the Artemis program. Wallops, of course, is our only agency NASA-owned test launch range. So it's actually um, the opportunity and ability to launch from the East Coast, and it allows us to have access to space for exploration, development, and demonstrations, maturity of science and mission-related technology. Um, Wallops actually has a, a, a launch range, its fixed ground station assets are in Virginia and Bermuda, and so we see these being used for human exploration in the future as well. Emerging technologies, of course, there are many, but 3D printed electronics um, on the nano scale. We've got integrated photonics, and you can see a very small exoplanet spectrograph can be developed. We've got teraflop computing and terabit communications. Quantum technologies, as mentioned before, but um, I did not mention we also have um, a collaboration with an SBIR company, um, which is an ant. Uh, atomic interferometer gravity gradient instrument. So it's space-based quantum sensing and then artificial attention and machine learning to help us with looking at things like with our MODIS um, instrument, potentially predicting or seeing um, forest fires in a way that we had in the past. So this brings me back to this chart here and I'm ready to close, but we really see that there are opportunities for people to collaborate with us 
in so many ways as we step forward into um, back into the moon race. So Maryland to the moon. Um, and we hope that you guys are interested in collaborating with us in the future. So Jeff, I will end on that note. Thank you very much, Dr. Erickson. Thank you for such a uh, in interesting, insightful, uh, informative talk. We have a few questions that we'd like to direct to you um, from the chat. One question that we have is, um, do you think that NASA is prepared from a technical perspective for long-term moon and Mars missions? What are your thoughts on long-term moon and Mars missions from, from NASA's perspectives? We have the ability to get there, right? It's it's the long duration that we're building up that capability. I love the moon, the, the movie The Martian, right? Because it really does an excellent job of, of really a lot of the challenges that one would experience in long-term duration flight on a Martian surface. However, there are definitely some kinks to be worked out. Um, and NASA has the, the one of the challenges is not really a tech is so much the technical, but it's really about money. You know, it's it's going to take quite a large sum of money to get us there to create these um, platforms to launch from. So, you know, ISS is one, but you know, we we would see ourselves launching midstream from some other platform to get us, you know, further out into space easier, not launching off of the surface, and then of course to begin to set up a permanent um, base on the moon will have, uh, you know, other challenges. But I, I do think that a large part about it is, is finances. Sure. We've got one, time for one more question. Uh, and that's, um, how do you see um, the new technology that you mentioned and the new ways of thinking and, and operating in COVID, how do you see those continue to be used once we come out of COVID and get back to a face-to-face? So I think COVID has changed us forever, right? It, we, we're probably not, any of us, likely to go back to exactly how we were before this. I, I already, I was having a conversation with my boss that, you know, he's like, yeah, your job, you know, yes, you need to be here, but yes, you don't need to be here. So I'm already talking about having that hybrid approach of doing less time at work um, physically in the building, but more time uh, away, which actually has a different type of effect um, and sometimes a non-intentional effect of not being able to communicate as easily. Um, and it sometimes is just easier to communicate with people in the room. In terms of um, the future, I think it actually shows that how when we all work together, we can actually come up with solutions um, quite more quickly, you know, in, a, in, in a, an extreme situation. If there's something dire, we were able to, you know, all rush forward, jump in there, and to be able to solve these problems. And I think that hopefully we'll see a lot more of that type of collaboration in the future. I think that people don't realize that NASA does communicate. And I saw a question in here about how, how much are we, how much are we collaborating with other countries? As I showed the International Space Station as an example, um, you know, 17 different countries worked and collaborated on that. Now, some engineers would say, yeah, it was harder because of it. But we also realize things like that take a lot of money and a lot of energy. So James Webb is another very successful collaboration. European Space Agency was, you know, our huge partner in that. We often partner with um, the Japanese as well as Canada. Um, um, I'm, I'm extending my reach into South America. I've also been, you know, uh, having conversations with um, South Africa with their, you know, sort of junior. Um, space agency, they're probably one of the more junior. And so I do see that COVID has brought us together in a way that is different. Um, and the nice thing is that it, I don't have to go into a large conference room with a bit set up to be able to talk to my colleagues on the other side of the world with my own computer. Sure. Yeah, All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arison, for that talk. Let's, oh, quick round of applause. Thank you. And um, also in um, recognition uh, of your talk, we're going to be presenting you with this virtual plaque tonight that you'll get physically, which reads that ACM Baltimore chapter extends our appreciation to you, Dr. April Erickson, for delivering one of the inaugural invited talks at our, at our kickoff meeting, the, um, the ACM Ch Baltimore chapter inaugural seminar 2022, Laurel, Maryland, February 24th, 2022. All right. And with that, I'm going to now introduce our 
last speaker of the night, and I'll bring uh, Ashutosh Duda to the podium to introduce him. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Actually, uh, this is a distinct pleasure for me. Uh, Professor Henning Shildurin is my PhD advisor uh, at Columbia University. This is always a pleasure, uh, things I've learned from him. Uh, I am using that in my professional life, even today at Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Lab. So always a distinct pleasure to introduce my, my advisor, uh, Professor Henning Shildurin. Uh, who is a Levi Professor of Computer Science at Columbia University. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He was an MTS at at and Bell Labs, Associate Department Head at GMD Focus in Germany, and before he joined Computer Science at Columbia. Um, he has both joint appointment in Computer Science and Electrical Engineering, in fact. Among other things, uh, he served the Chair for Department of Computer Science from 2004 to 2009. He was an Engineering Fellow. Uh, technology advisor. He also had a stint as a chief uh, technology officer at the FCC uh, from 2010 to 2017 um, altogether. And 2019, 2020, he worked as a technology fellow in US Senate. Uh, he's a fellow of ACM and IEEE. Uh, he has actually given a lot of talks in IEEE conferences, uh, in, including 5G World Forum. Received the New York City's Mayor's Award for Excellence in Science and Technology, uh, the voice of Net Pioneer Award, TCC Service Award, IEEE Internet Award, uh, Region 1, William Terry Award for Lifetime Distinguished Service, uh, University of Massachusetts Computer Science Outstanding Alumni Recognition. He's also a member of Internet Hall of Fame. Um, most importantly, uh, he has developed the protocols like SIP, RTP, RTSP, which uh, we all use today uh, for voice over IP and uh, internet telephony. So in, in that regards, uh, He's often known as the father of internet telephony. So you listen to the father of internet, and then we had interesting talk from NASA. Uh, now let's see, uh, Professor Shuldrin uh, has something to talk about internet. How can you make it um, digitally, you know, the digital inclusion, right? How do you make sure the internet is all pervasive? Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand it over to Professor Shuldrin uh, for the last uh, invited talk for today. Thank, Thank you. you much. Uh, I will switch sharing if I don't mind. So thank you for sticking around uh, late into the evening. So uh, I'm going to try to ground you after having uh, heard this inspiring um, space leave, uh, earth leaving talk. This is going to be much more earthbound in a number of both literal and metaphysical ways. So what I want to convince you of is that one of the more important, but also fortunately one of the more solvable problems both in the United States and internationally is uh, now that the uh, internet is technically mature, how do we make sure that everybody who wants to get on can get on and uh, enjoy the benefits of the technology. Uh, I have to make the disclaimer, I'm uh, ignoring for today's talk all the challenges that go along with uh, widespread internet availability, uh, the mis and disinformation and all the other things. That is a subject of a very different talk. So for now, I will simply focus on uh, getting the internet to people uh, in, in a way that uh, reaches everyone. So the three mantras of digital inclusion and where digital inclusion means the uh, ability of everybody to get on the internet and importantly, to use it productively, as in it is not just a technology that you use like plugging a toaster into a wall socket. If you want to use internet to your personal benefit, and we all take this for granted, you need uh, digital literacy and other skills to actually uh, use it. Here, I'm going to be focusing primarily on two critical aspects, namely, how do we make sure that the internet actually is available to everybody? And importantly, even if it is available, it doesn't do any good if families cannot actually afford to purchase internet service in that. So there's an increasing recognition that we need 
both uh, availability, affordability, and separately also relevance. I'll try to give a quick overview of some of the key reasons that even though we are now roughly 50 years into the technical development of the internet, that, that still has left many parts, even of relatively rich countries like the United States, unconnected or connected poorly uh, in that. This is partially a technology problem. I, and we might even be able to use some of the technology that was mentioned in the previous talk, maybe at a somewhat smaller scale than the uh, huge uh, drill that was shown there um, to help with that. But it is largely a policy and again, in a different context mentioned previously, a money problem. Uh, in, uh, as in, we know how to solve the problem technically, largely. Uh, we just have to find ways to finance that particular effort. Uh, increasingly, uh, the ability for families, naturally, primarily low income families, to afford internet access is probably becoming a larger problem numerically, as in, it affects more people than mere availability or not. Uh, it has become clear that while the private sector will continue to play the dominant role in deploying internet, uh, getting it deployed in rural and low income areas and to low income families will likely require not just in the United States, but elsewhere, the active participation of government, both at the federal level in the United States and at the state, in some cases, local level as well. Since I only have a limited amount of time, and since my familiarity is mostly in the United States policy realm, I will be focusing on the United States. Uh, but some of the issues are, are pretty universal, again, uh, primarily for higher income countries uh, that I will be talking about. But I do want to talk about a somewhat uh, coarse distinction between uh, the problem of digital inclusion in the global north and the global south. So in the global north, which uh, roughly shown on the map here, so relatively speaking, higher income countries, uh, you have a widely available uh, fixed uh, or wired broadband, meaning internet access, uh, infrastructure at least partially exists, often built up since uh, my kind of early part of the 20th century or even earlier and not have copper loops going to pretty much any residence and not. Thus, the biggest challenge for fixed broadband tends to be the transition from a copper-based infrastructure to a fiber and to some lesser extent fixed wireless infrastructure, not necessarily starting from scratch. The problem tends to be focused on the least connected roughly, and it's obviously of course a number 10 to maybe 20% of the population, uh, typically upwards of 80% of households have uh, reasonably good, uh, maybe overly expensive, but reasonably good uh, internet access. As I mentioned, a large reason for not having close to 100% availability for use of uh, home broadband in particular is that uh, it is too expensive for man, many families, as well as issues of adoption, digital literature, di digital literacy and related uh, issues. And, uh, and there's an increasing focus on new applications, uh, factory 4.0, telehealth, particularly in rural areas, distance learning that we've all gotten to know over the past two years and so on. In the global south, the challenges are somewhat different. Uh, wired connectivity is generally scarce outside cities, certainly. So we are in a mobile first environment. Uh, really almost all the efforts are on deploying higher speed uh, mobile internet access, not as much running fiber to the home. You know, that's really of lesser concern 
talking now. Often, uh, the challenge is to go from 2G to 4 and 5G, uh, and now primarily to 4G at the moment uh, elsewhere, because that provides decent quality, at least basic broadband access to many internet applications. Uh, and that is more likely to be more productive than waiting for fiber deployment to the home uh, outside again, some uh, relatively small and high income parts of those countries. Uh, the challenges tend to be focused on middle mile. And in some cases, as we saw recently, very recently, island of Tonga, after the uh, volcano eruption, that they are often only connected by satellite or by one fiber that is then vulnerable to disruption for that, as well as interconnection. Uh, in many such countries, they tend to interconnect via the United States so that uh, if they want to talk to a neighboring country, uh, connection, the internet connection actually traverses the United States or some other uh, near, nearby uh, higher income country before it goes back to a few hundred miles uh, east or west. So, uh, and, uh, uh, broad based affordability is a huge problem even for mobile services and often mobile services are unaffordable to a large fraction of the population and the emphasis are on things like banking, health, and jobs, which isn't all that different uh, in the global north. Uh, in the United States and other um, countries that have a long history of telecommunication deployment, the notion of what is called universal service is an ancient one by now. Indeed, the term itself is more than 100 years old. So this is a poster from the uh, Bell system in that, that actually pitched essentially its um, claim to a monopoly status with the promise of providing a service to everyone in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and this was not just a technical issue or even mostly not a technical issue. It was largely a financial issue. Even during the early days of the telephone service, it was far more uh, cost effective and far more profitable to provide local service in, say, New York City than in upstate New York, or uh, simply because the distances that you had to cover per customer were so much smaller in Manhattan, and generally speaking. Uh, most families in Manhattan and businesses in particular were willing to pay more for telephone service too. And the way that the problem was at least solved so that by the 1950s and 1960s in the United States and many other countries, uh, pretty much everybody as an upwards of 95% of homes had residential phone service was not just the generosity of AT&T and the international brethren, but it was a explicit cost subsidy. Namely, uh, the, the tariffs for a service were designed in such a way that uh, AT&T was allowed to charge more in urban areas and subsidized rural areas. And that mechanism broke down with the introduction of competition starting in 1984 and uh, most uh, deliberately in 1996 with the Telecommunications Act, um, similar type of developments happened in other countries. But now you could no longer rely on a single monopolist to serve a whole state simply because they were competing with other uh, carriers for the most lucrative customers, and so could not be expected to cross subsidies. So let's, before we talk about solution, uh, let's talk a little bit about what the problem scale and scope is. So if we look globally, um, we have roughly in the past 10 years or so, crossed half the world population in reaching uh, some internet connectivity, largely mobile, certainly. But that growth has actually been slowing down. That is a separate discussion, but we are now reaching 
a country and parts of a country that are harder to serve, where the incremental cost and effort is much larger than it used to be, say, 10 years ago, when you could serve, let's say, largely urban or suburban areas, both in, say, the United States and elsewhere. In the United States, a broadband, home broadband access, and when I say broadband, um, I'm going to be talking about home broadband, not mobile, right, 4G, 5G right, going forward, simply because that's the more dominant problem, is very much an income issue. You can see that here, that starting roughly in the 2010s, uh, high income households with the highest chart there, uh, at about $75,000 households, have um, settled, so to say, in the well above 80% and of households have it. So there's still households clearly that don't have it for a variety of reasons uh, in that, but it's reaching, you can pretty much assume that somebody who has that level of income has it. If you go down to um, low income households, we're now talking to roughly half of households really only having home broadband access, even uh, as of now. The geographic distribution is also, as you might expect, extremely uneven. Now, this is partially because of density issues that I mentioned, but it is also because many rural areas tend to have lower income. And uh, so there are counties, say, that have only uh, 120 of roughly of the population that uh, is on the internet, while others have well above 80% uh, internet access in that. And as with so many uh, issues, uh, race matters as well. Uh, it is clearly correlated with income, uh, but generally speaking, uh, we have about a 10% difference in broadband adoption uh, by households, by race. Uh, we are roughly speaking Black and Hispanic households are about a decade behind in adoption and that for a variety of reasons, uh, again, income um, and uh, rural factors, as well as in some cases, actions of the carriers uh, that make it more difficult for uh, those groups to receive internet access, even in urban areas. Increasingly, we are seeing a bifurcation I, it used to be you were typically on the internet only when you had home internet access through, let's say, dial-up modem or cable modem or something like that. Increasingly, we have a large share of U.S. adults who only use the internet through a smartphone. Uh, in that. that is certainly better in some ways than nothing. A, a number of applications can be well, you can use those on a smartphone uh, in that for information gathering and email and so on uh, in that. But smartphones tend to be consumption devices unless you're recording a TikTok video uh, in that. It is really hard to do uh, your homework assignment on a smartphone. Uh, it's hard to do telework. I don't think any of us during the past two years did too many Zoom calls on our phone. We usually reverted to at least an iPad uh, to do that simply because it's just more productive, easier to see slides, for example, and so on uh, in that. And the prevalence of smartphone-only internet access is very much a um, income-driven uh, phenomenon. So this is not necessarily a choice. Uh, this is often driven by that's what you can afford. Uh, if we look by geography, is that you have a, a distinction by speed, as in there's a relatively small fraction in the United States that has no internet access whatsoever. Uh, you can, if you have a phone line, you can probably get some internet access, but it is extremely slow. So uh, only about 0.7% have no internet access, even at three megabit uh, in that. But if you get to a more reasonable numbers, you're probably talking about 10, seven to 10%. In that. And this varies greatly that in rural area, that number is up to about a quarter in that. One of the other challenges is that we don't even know the precise numbers. Uh, because of insufficiency and in how we count broadband internet access in the United States, we have this problem 
that we don't know exactly how many people have it, except that we know that statistics are far too optimistic and that the actual numbers compared to the pie charts, they're actually significantly large. So whatever causes. So you could say, well, we should just look at population density, but that's really not sufficient. Uh, what matters is not the population density across the country. What matters is how concentrated the population is uh, where it lives. And so uh, as an example, I've just, uh, even though Australia, for example, and Canada have far lower population density than the United States, by factor 10, roughly speaking, uh, and that it, people who do live in, the, uh, in those countries tend to have, tend to all live in a relatively small part. So that vast stretches, hardly anybody lives. The United States is far more distributed uh, in that, uh, which makes the challenge larger simply because you can't just serve, let's say the, uh, the coastal area in Australia or be strip along the US Canadian border to reach almost everybody. So what's the challenge in a, uh, single slide is that we have these three factors that go together, namely availability, affordability, and relevance. I mentioned that already. They're connected. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's not available. It doesn't matter if it's affordable, vice versa. If it's affordable, but not available, well, what good does that do um, if it's not in your neighborhood? Uh, and clearly internet content uh, has to be relevant uh, as well, because otherwise, even if you might have the money available, you might spend it on something else. Uh, in that. So these three factors, while we talk about them separately, are closely connected. Indeed, we now have a much better idea as to why households beyond those 80 or so percent uh, overall do not adopt is uh, largely having to do with uh, the uh, reasons of cost, again, uh, both relative and absolute cost factors. So in the United States in particular, the availability of broadband is a um, challenge or is driven largely by what happened not in the last 10 years, but uh, the, uh, what happened in the last um, uh, 20, 30, and 40 years. So uh, in particular, a very large fraction of what we use to get internet service is actually infrastructure that was put in in the 1980s, or in the case of the DSL infrastructure in the 18, not 80s quite, but 1890s in some cases, in the earliest cases, namely telephone wires. So I'm uh, starting in uh, about the early 1990s, we used DSL modems to carry relative, at the, high, at the time, high-speed data, a few megabits, now maybe a few, at best a few tens of megabit, uh, across those same phone lines that has served as voice lines early on uh, in that. And the evolution of that technology pretty much peaked at about in the year 2000. In the United States, we actually had also starting in the 1980s with rapid deployment so that about 60% of households had cable television in 1995. No internet, but cable television, which then starting in the late 1990s could be converted with modest effort using the DOCSIS standard into high-speed internet access, relatively speaking. And we now have technology that at least in theory, not in practice typically, can provide uh, about a gigabit download um, in that and maybe even more. Indeed, we reached about 80% households about 10 years ago uh, that had cable television and could use that in large part also for internet access. So again, we had the advantage that we had two uh, internet in access infrastructures that largely did not require building physical infrastructure in urban areas and suburban areas. And indeed, uh, 
turning back to an international comparison, it is striking to see that countries that have very similar economic characteristics, as in, for example, they have relatively high income uh, countries are uh, in that, have very different breakdowns in how people receive internet access at home. So just to take example, the highest connected country right now, which country obviously is Switzerland uh, in that, but they still get, and this is with dark blue bar at the bottom, they still get a very large fraction about roughly almost half of that by a DSL. While a country that has a lower per capita income, Korea, famously gets almost all its high speed internet access uh, by uh, uh, fiber and has traditionally had almost no cable access. While other countries, uh, such as in, uh, say, the United States, uh, to take that as an example, have relatively low, uh, this is, you know, since we here and not kind of middling in terms of overall broadband availability, has a very large fraction, namely the middle kind of brighter blue bar is cable and is unique except for a few small countries like the Netherlands in using relying so much on cable service and thus having relatively low fiber deployment compared to other countries. Uh, and, uh, so si similar countries just for historical reasons, very different deployment, which also means that the challenge of deploying modern broadband of maybe 100 megabits or so are just very different across different countries, even though they have very similar income um, and uh, relatively similar in other ways. Uh, and this is just a different uh, representation on that, namely the, that the fiber to the home fraction differs dramatically. So how do we improve availability uh, in that? So the first question is, how much speed do we actually need? Uh, and there has for a very long time in the United States in particular been a tussle between industry um, advocates, uh, industry lobbyists, who have traditionally argued that most people don't need a whole lot of them. Uh, so that I'm on four megabits, say, or less than that was sufficient for most applications. Indeed, individually, most applications are shown here. I'm not going to go through that in detail. Uh, even your Zoom call individually probably um, only uses a few megabits or so uh, in that. But that often has led to deployments of networks that tended to be relatively low speed and then ran out of headroom relatively quickly. So advocates for consumers tend to emphasize that we should not build networks for the needs of today, but for a much higher bandwidth and maybe family oriented aggregate bandwidth demands when everybody is on Zoom or Netflix uh, on that simultaneously. Uh, and so we should aim for networks designed for 10 and 20 years out, not for a network that barely suffices for today's needs. So the definition of broadband in the United States has changed in that. So the last update of that definition is now about seven years old, uh, is what generally referred to as 25.3. So broadband is defined as meeting the standard of 25 uh, download and three megabits upload. Uh, and now generally speaking, they're all asymmetric uh, in their definition. So that is the legal definition in that other countries have somewhat different uh, thresholds for that. The other issue is that not just have the need for speed increase because of new application, but until very recently, uh, the growth rate in the number of gigabytes per household, and this is the median one, so mean is higher, uh, has steadily increased at about a rate of about 35%, about a third every year since 2017. Uh, in, uh, um, that actually, I just updated the, the, the graph uh, yesterday. It's the first time that I've seen uh, that this, I assume, is pandemic induced, that we actually have seen a decrease. This is for one carrier, which has been publishing this data consistently. So it makes for a nice time series um, that we've actually seen a decrease by one gigabyte. Uh, and we'll see how long that lasts. So when we talk about the technology 
uh, and your, the question I see in the chat is actually an interesting one. It directly, uh, maybe I can address it while I'm talking about this one here. Is we talk a lot about different technologies. Should we use satellite? Should we use fixed wireless? Should we use fiber in that? And the way I like to think about this is not so much speed. You can now do 100 megabits with pretty much any of these technologies. It's maybe a little harder for satellite, maybe a little harder uh, for uh, fixed wireless, but well, you can get uh, 100 megabits and more with Starlink Leos, for example. That's no longer of a problem uh, in and of itself, unless you really want gigabits. Uh, the problem that you run into is the gigabytes per subscriber and the gigabytes per square mile per population. Is generally speaking, uh, for low density, meaning where the density of gigabytes per month or per hour, whatever you want to name the take, is low, satellite is really effective because you can cover with one launch, uh, you can cover say traditionally with a geostationary satellite, you can cover all of North America right now. Man, satellite is expensive, man, $10 million, whatever it costs, but man, $10 million for the whole United States, man, it's a trivial cost uh, in that. But those satellites typically can only supply at most uh, a few hundred thousand um, customers across their coverage territory. Now, they just don't have the capacity because it's a wireless link up, wireless link down uh, to make that happen. There's the spectrum available, the power, the antenna size is not just uh, getting more spectrum up there. This is just not possible. Now. And even the LEO satellites, generally speaking, simply because they don't have the individual bandwidth capacity for because of spectral uh, constraints to do that, they're unlikely to serve more than a few hundred thousand or maybe a million users in the United States. So they are really good for the lowest density areas. They just don't scale uh, to anything uh, approximating a large country. Uh, in, uh, Leos have other problems, uh, the economics, the, their lifetime tends to be short. So you have to continuously replenish uh, the satellites that keep burning up in the atmosphere because they're, well, they're in, a, in a dense atmosphere. So they don't last as long. Uh, so they have other economic problems. So for that reason, uh, even though the economics seem attractive, particularly for geoeconomics uh, in that they just don't scale. Uh, in that. So we're pretty much stuck uh, with terrestrial, I want, and there have been other attempts, I won't talk about those, uh, simply because it just haven't panned out in that. So the notion, the question really is, where do you deploy fiber and where do you deploy terrestrial fixed wireless typically, meaning wireless that either that has a fixed receiver as opposed to mobile or cellular wireless. Uh, and, uh, and the cost curves there tend to be more productive, so to say, for fixed wireless at the tail end of it. So the way I like to think of it is, is economically speaking, satellite are works best once the dense household density per road mile, which is really the critical number that you look at, not population density per square mile, but from how are households strung across roads, since most people live along roads, unless you're in Alaska. Um, and so that generally speaking, uh, cable and thick fiber to the home are economic, uh, to, to deploy for anywhere starting at 20 to 100 households per square, uh, per mile of uh, density. So if you have 100 households per mile of road, um, you can, rural electric cooperatives, that's what the RIC stands for, um, can deploy uh, into lower density areas because they own the electric poles that they can reuse. And wireless internet service providers can go below that. Uh, and then if you're into like one mile, this average separation, you're probably in satellite territory. Uh, yep. um, so what is the challenge for rural broadband? So the question is who is going to build out? Uh, uh, so 
many of the traditional phone companies, which are known as incumbent local exchange carriers because that's a telephone designation, have no interest in that. The economics just don't work for them. And uh, um, in some cases, municipalities have tried to do that. So both smaller and larger ones, it just tends to be a very small number in the United States, relatively speaking, for both legal reasons. Uh, in 18 states, uh, state uh, governments have prohibited um, building out by municipalities. Uh, one can one doesn't have to guess far as to who had uh, an interest in passing those laws. Um, and increasingly, uh, electric utilities, uh, electric cooperatives, so these are nonprofit uh, entities that provide electric distribution, not generation typically, to rural areas and were instrumental in connecting rural areas to electricity in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, and that they serve a very large number and many of those have started to upgrade their infrastructure to serve uh, copper, I'm sorry, to serve fiber as well as um, electricity uh, as well. But obviously have to string cop, uh, fiber lines in addition to the copper that they have in that. So again, in many cases, the question that has risen traditionally is to upgrade the additional, uh, the traditional copper infrastructure, or do you build out fiber? Increasingly, uh, the notion is, except for the most rural areas, you're probably better off doing fiber simply because the bandwidth is essentially infinite uh, by upgrading electronics. And as usual, the big question is, who's going to pay for it? Uh, do you subsidize it once uh, you build it and then you have to, uh, or do you subsidize it forever? And there have been some interesting approaches on uh, like high altitude uh, platforms, uh, apps, or TV white spaces. Generally speaking, they have not panned out. Uh, it's really, we're back down to the boring uh, stuff, namely stringing fiber and in some cases running fixed wireless, maybe satellites in some cases. So let's talk about uh, the economics a bit. Surprisingly, even though I talk a lot about constructing networks, even rural networks, the largest fraction of the cost of what you pay is actually not the building part of it. That's usually only about 15% of the revenue that you pay goes into constructing networks and repairing and replacing it. It is the operations of it, namely the people you talk to on the telephone after waiting for an hour in line when you need tech support or when you want to cancel your service. Uh, the people who manage the network, the people who repair it when um, it fails and so on. So construction, even in rural areas, tends to be a smaller fraction. And the largest parts, about 70% of the construction uh, of cost of building network is not the fiber or the electronics and all the stuff that network engineers get excited about. It is people climbing up poles or digging trenches uh, in that since my, the efficiency of that has not increased substantially since 1950s, since we had motorized equipment to do the digging instead of using shovels uh, and that. So generally speaking, um, the, oh, power line internet. Yeah, well, um, that was another idea which turned out to be sounded uh, very promising uh, and it was really only deployed in one location in the United States. Uh, and that uh, the problem was it was never outside the home. I mean, it's pop, it used to be somewhat popular and still usable within the home, but it is uh, generally was able to only achieve about a megabit or two in that. And uh, not surprisingly, if, you, if you're an electrical engineer, if you're going to use a power line as a conductor for data and you don't have twisted pairs, you've also just built a giant antenna, which just happens to emanate uh, in the radio frequency, lower radio frequency spectrum and absolutely destroyed the amateur radio bands in particular uh, in that because it's all in the, the amateur bands in that. So 
uh, it was extremely unpopular to debate politely with amateur radio as well as other more commercial radio applications simply because you've just built a, a giant antenna uh, to, uh, that emanates uh, power all along the, uh, the road. So I, nobody that I've talked to in the last whatever 10 years um, is I mean, excited about power line, uh, except power lines as a carrier um, for a uh, for fiber that you uh, use the existing poles and in some cases uh, the actual electric wiring to carry fiber. Uh, you know. So um, TV TV uh, yeah TV white spaces another one they've been successful generally they're great for a megabit or two um, on average they tend to have floundered for anything approaching 100 megabit. So they're great for the first megabit. They just don't work very well in practice uh, for anything larger. You can theoretically do more, uh, maybe 10. But in the US, nobody's going to get excited about 10 megabit internet. It's just not worth the hassle uh, in that. So I might have a role somewhere, but I just don't see it. Uh, playing. Well, as I said, this has been hyped in the United States by a number of uh, entities, the number of customers that actually use TV white spaces is, is a rounding error. Um, is that it's a few thousand people, best I can tell. Um, and speed is not the, yeah, so capacity is the issue. Um, but TV white spaces has, I uh, mean, you typically get a five or six megahertz bandwidth in that. And even with the most aggressive modulation, which you typically don't get, uh, you get maybe 10 bits per hertz uh, in that. So you get 60 megabits shared among everybody who's sharing the channel. And that just isn't terribly exciting. So um, it's just really hard. Uh, to get significant bandwidth. So for TV wide spaces, that's why I said nobody that I know of is uh, in the US, again, this is el different elsewhere, is all that excited about uh, using TV wide spaces for bandwidth just available. Because even in rural areas in the United States, the TV spectrum is pretty well occupied these days um, for a variety of te technical and non-technical reasons. And so there isn't really a whole lot of white space available uh, in that. that's different in other countries uh, that haven't done the digital dividend uh, auctions uh, as much as the US has. So it just, I said, uh, I'm not saying this is useless elsewhere in the US. I've not heard anybody seriously propose that as a solution at scale. You just can't get the capacity that you need to make this uh, interesting. Uh, so what's the cost? Uh, yep, yeah, answer later. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, so, uh, the, um, when we talk about the cost, it's about 50K per mile. So, again, if you only have 10 households per mile, I'm taking 10K uh, and 5K per household. Uh, that's a lot of money to spend. Most households are unwilling to do that. Okay. So, how do we pay for all of this? Um, in the US, and this is as far as I know, the United States is the only, uh, maybe one other country or two, but it's extremely unusual that it's doing that way. Namely, we pay a tax that is collected through the phone bill, uh, about 25 to 30% on long distance uh, calls, which collects about $8 billion a year, which is then used for uh, High cost, which is for rural areas, for E rate, which is schools and libraries, lifeline, low income, and rural healthcare, which is a small amount, uh, two carriers and schools. Uh, and there have been a huge number of programs. Uh, this chart is only meant to illustrate that the US government has for many years tried to set up programs to distribute money to rural carriers in particular uh, with some but modest success. Uh, so if you are so inclined, you can look at your phone bill and uh, you see a fee that is called Federal Universal Service Fund fee, uh, which is usually about two bucks or so per month on your phone bill, uh, both mobile and landline, if you still have a landline phone at home. And that is used to pay for these things that I mentioned earlier. So it's a uh, special taxing mechanism, even though it's called a fund. It's really a tax. Uh, 
So uh, there have been uh, programs that I uh, traditionally just handed out money to carriers. More recently, there have been auction models uh, that I would um, be allocating money to the entity that was willing to provide that service at the lowest cost uh, in that. So kind of a, what's called a reverse auction. So every um, multiple carriers could bid on um, a particular part of a state and would get the lowest bidder, uh, would get uh, the subsidy and would then build out with a weighting of the bids by speed. So you, if you bid a low speed, you had to bid lower than if you bid a fiber connection. And so that fund um, was auctioned off in 2020. And you can see roughly uh, that which areas ended up being covered. So it's kind of little blotches all over the United States. More recently, uh, very recently, uh, the uh, multi uh, hundred billion dollar infrastructure investment jobs act that Congress passed. Uh, one of the large components is a component of 42 billion, which is that one the largest broadband investment ever uh, that will be doled out through a part of a Department of Commerce, NTAA, uh, to the states, which will then uh, hand it out to providers that offer to offer services uh, in unserved or underserved areas. And first, they'll uh, spend the money on areas that have uh, no 25-3 broadband, and then uh, any money left over goes to areas that have some broadband, but relatively low speed areas uh, in that. And almost all of it is going to be fixed wireless or fiber. It's not going to be satellite uh, in particular in that. Before they do that, they have to gather data on uh, the availability of broadband uh, that Congress mandated that. Uh, so every street location, every home, will, there will be a giant database uh, being set up as we speak, uh, to document every street address uh, and every geographic areas for mobile services, whether they have uh, broadband available, which doesn't exist uh, today. So let me talk very briefly before I run out of time completely uh, about the other problem, namely, how do we ensure that low income households have access to phone service and data? Starting in 1985, the FCC set up a low income program, which is sometimes known as Obama phones, which is a misleading um, name for it, but it's a subsidy where currently, if you are on a, a, a participant in one of the federal low income programs, such as uh, food stamps or Medicaid in particular, you get a uh, phone service subsidy of $9.25 per month, which usually means you get a free uh, service of some number of voice minutes and these days about four gigabytes of data in that. So uh, companies like TrackPhone and others provide that service uh, to low income consumers. You have to prove that you get one of those um, uh, services like uh, Medicaid, and then you're eligible to, to so Lifeline, even though it is a free service, has not reached most eligible consumers. It's not well known. It's often quite difficult to qualify that. Uh, so in that sense, it has been a modestly successful mechanism for reaching, uh, providing basic internet access and voice of service to low income households. There have also been some attempts, uh, this is Comcast uh, successful uh, model with internet essentials, where if you are low income, uh, you can get a service for $10 a month. Uh, COVID changed that thinking. Uh, it was the notion that you uh, that broadband was a luxury and that it meant if all you needed was email, you could just do it on your phone, truly was no longer sufficient uh, in that. So, you had this issue that you needed broadband, particularly for students, so that they could go to school uh, and uh, participate in any kind of education uh, in that. So Congress set up a program uh, that uh, was called Emergency Broadband Benefit that provided a subsidy during 
uh, during the uh, early months and year of the uh, pandemic. And that has now been replaced by a more permanent program called the Affordable Connectivity Program, which provides a 30 month subsidy uh, to eligible households uh, in that. And that program seems to be just started, but seems reasonably successful uh, in that. And, uh, if you work for or are connected to a school, for example, uh, it's one of the things that you could and should do is make students aware of that. You don't have to be a citizen to get it. Uh, if, you, if kids receive uh, nutrition assistance at school, school lunches, uh, their families are uh, eligible for uh, that uh, subsidy. Uh, so let me conclude. Um, in general, we have started to recognize for many years that getting access to broadband is no longer just a luxury. It is as vital as getting access to electricity and drinkable water and, uh, and other basic services. And so the three challenges have been availability, primarily in rural areas, affordability across the United States for low-income households, and relevance, namely for people who may not know that and how to use the internet and what to use it for, uh, to train them to that they can use it for education, health, and job opportunities. The economics of deploying to both low income and rural households mean that government have to step in in many cases to do that. Uh, waiting for uh, private uh, interest is you're going to wait a long time in many cases. Uh, so the challenge is who should subsidize these high and low uh, cost and low income areas? Should it be fees or should it be taxes? How should this be done? That's going to be one of the challenges going forward. Um, also from a technology perspective, how do we ensure uh, that the cost of these networks is as small as possible because they're going to be subsidized by all of us as taxpayers? Uh, and with that, I'll turn to you Assuming we have some time available, I see all the questions popping up. I uh, uh, let Ashutosh uh, prioritize the questions. Here in England, let's give a big hand to the speaker. So um, I know, uh, Henning, uh, you had a long class today in the evening and really appreciate taking uh, precious time, um, but this is appreciated by all of us. Um, I know you have been answering some questions. There has been some comments, question, and people have any questions, please uh, put it in the chat box. We are also saving um, those. Uh, so one, one comment is, uh, does Henning predict the death of the internet, internet transit, since most of the traffic is increasingly going through the large scale operator? Um, that's a somewhat separate topic. That is certainly the case. I, I, one of the challenges going forward is uh, the economics for uh, backhaul operators uh, are becoming increasingly challenging. Uh, what is now happening, however, that uh, they are really surviving not on classical transit, but on uh, interconnecting data centers. So most of the money that are made by providers is that. And classical transit is, is replaced really by intra-company transit, uh, namely uh, data, uh, long haul data, both trans-oceanic uh, as well as trans-continental operated by Facebook, Google, and, and other, um, and other the big providers that run their own private networks basically. Uh, in that. So th that's a different form of transit. It's not neutral transit in the sense uh, in that that will indeed be uh, challenging, but because of the data centers and since Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft at the moment are not running domestic and US fiber networks of, uh, at, at length is that that will probably be the uh, transit replacement. But yes, definitely uh, traffic is moving off transit and the traditional transit model is pretty much dead. There's really only one, two providers left in the United States that are pure transit providers and, and both uh, Cogent and Zao, and both of those are largely subsisting on, uh, on commercial connectivity to data centers, not on uh, traditional transit. 
Sure, sure. Yeah. So Henning, I know um, there are a lot of study in the FCC uh, broadband when you're up there as a CTO. Um, there is a question uh, here, your take on municipal broad broadband, right? Um, how things have improved or progress in the last few years? Municipal broadband. So that's an interesting one. Um, and let me give you two, well, this clearly is a very long discussion uh, in that. So like I said, in some states, um, make it very difficult to deploy municipal plants. But in mind, there are clearly more than half of states where it is possible. But even there, it has not become widespread. I mean, this is the reasoning is again largely economics. Is the it is in mind, the areas that are not covered by traditional providers tend to be areas that are either poor or low density. So the economics for um, municipal brand broadband in those areas aren't all that great to begin with too. So you have the same problem. Um, and often what tends to happen is when a where municipal broadband is getting built out, then you have, since this takes a while, uh, the incumbent provider now seeing competition says, hey, I better upgrade that particular city to higher speed or fiber or whatever. So by the time the municipal broadband network is built out, you then have a competitor, a private sector competitor that would not be building out elsewhere. Often many of the incumbents don't build out higher speed until fairly recently, but sensing competition they will. Uh, and uh, so that makes it financially somewhat risky. Uh, what's been happening is that there, uh, there's now a lot of discussion about hybrid models uh, where say the fiber infrastructure is maintained by the municipality. That model has been very successful in some European countries where the electric utility owns the fiber of a conduit, but the actual service is provided by uh, a private or typically several private uh, operators on top of a shared municipally owned uh, infrastructure. So that's my attempt to make it uh, as um, a short version as more to be said on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think we'll just take one more question. Um, there are a lot of interesting questions. This is something um, I remember you gave a talk at the Future Network Initiative webinar about Wi Fi. Uh, so, this specific yeah. question again, uh, we are working with a startup called Mess Plus Plus. Uh, it looks like it was set up just to take care of uh, you know this access to everybody. So they have been successful in providing Wi-Fi in public spaces because they are purely long range wireless. It's much cheaper to put solar power Wi-Fi on a pole. So they appear to have solved the multi-hub wireless and can provide wireless in a mile away from a fiber link. So you have any take on that? Yeah, so, and again, I'm not, um, I, I, I would never, but more technologies uh, for particular niches are always a good thing because there's almost for any technology, uh, let's say I mean, with the exception maybe a power line wireless, which uh, has really only found a niche inside the home, actually quite a useful niche inside the homes uh, in that, uh, that almost any other technology is useful somewhere uh, in that. So the question that is more interesting is, which densities can these mesh technologies serve well? So the physics remain that generally speaking, each mesh link uh, that you're going to have, again, particularly in areas that are low density, you're going to have these mesh links several miles apart. Otherwise, if you're denser, then you're probably in fiber territory. Um, so you have at least a mile of probably several miles apart. So you're talking on maybe a gigabit uh, link between them. So now you can do all the mesh magic. You're gonna be constrained. You have a backhaul link of a gigabit. It's just, come on, it's just physics. And you're not going to get more. So that's great. Uh, gigabit speed isn't bad, but that gigabit speed is gonna be shared among whoever is connected to that. As long as you only have one household or maybe 10 households connected to each node, that's all great. Uh, and then you get still get 100 megabits. But if you now have 100 households that have to share that backhaul link or that mesh link, then you're getting into the data uh, volume problem that I mentioned earlier. You're not speed constrained 
really, in the sense of the raw physical layer speed isn't your problem. The problem is you run out of gigabytes during the peak hours, uh, and that you just don't have enough capacity to do that. So I find mesh networks to be a good overlay. So for example, Brooklyn has, is deploying a mesh network, but we're talking a few hundred customers here, a few thousand customers and that. It's great for recovery networks. Uh, so we build a mesh network for a DAPA project uh, and that as part of their restoration type of exercises and networks for that. It's just not likely that it's going to deploy and, uh, at scale and that. The other problem, and this is something that people didn't appreciate for DSL and to some extent for cable, is that if you have, what you want to avoid is having active infrastructure in hostile areas. Hostile, not so much because it's somebody, it's under army occupation, it is because you're operating an environment where if you have towers or particularly on poles, uh, people literally shoot at it in rural areas, big problem. Uh, use it for target practice. Uh, it's uh, after every thunderstorm, some number of those things are gonna come down. You have to replace them uh, in that. Uh, ice and other weather is not friendly to uh, these type of electronics. So the cost of maintenance of these active elements in particularly low density areas where you need a fair number of them is pretty high. So often what people have found is that the initial deployment cost for these wireless networks, particularly dense, wire, relatively speaking, dense wireless network, not just a big tower on a hill, is, is, is low, um, cheap electronics, or cheap installation, but the maintenance cost over time tends to be high and the reliability tends to be low, uh, simply because they tend to fail fairly frequently. Uh, and uh, even when you have a mesh network, you usually don't get the density in that. So that's a long-winded answer. So yeah. I would look at more than just for deployment costs, look at the maintenance costs. All right. So, so Henning, um, I think um, I just have the last question to wrap it up. Um, and, and there are some interesting comments in terms of, you know, which uh, country has the highest broadband, all those uh, yeah. can take a look at that. So question is, I'm trying to tie your talk. We have two interesting talks uh, before your talk. Um, I, I know you might have, might have missed uh, uh, Len Kleinrock's talk. Yep, uh, he talked about the internet, history of internet, you know, how things started. Uh, and now we still have like 50% uh, of the population still do not have broadband access. There are various uh, uh, activities, initiative going on, even within IEEE, the connecting the unconnected. Um, so to sum it up, right, if you see the wired, wireless, now 5G and 5G beyond 6G coming in, so how do you think uh, all this put together in Wi-Fi as well, right? How do you think we can really solve this problem of connecting the unconnected or the problem with digital divide, right? I mean, your talk is digital inclusion, which basically tries to take care of the problem of digital divide, right? Yep. Um, so what do you think? I mean, do you have prediction five years, 10 years from now, we can see 90% of the people will have penetration broadband? Is that uh, something you predict? I could have, yes. I mean, I, I suspect, and the question will no longer be in many cases, will there be physical availability? I mean, work Leo's and some of the other and widespread availability of 4G and 5G, there will be there will be uh, some density of bits per square mile pretty much everywhere except maybe in the most remote polar regions or something uh, in that. but uh, everywhere else you will have it. So the question is no longer directly as it will there be uh, broadband or some internet access. The question is, at what cost and what speed and what is the most appropriate technology. And so what I would see is that instead of arguing which is better, Leo's or Mesh or whatever, I, I would I say we should be, uh, as engineers, be uh, clear of the trade-offs that one makes for these type of uh, systems. Um, what are the design considerations? Where are different technologies most readily deployed? 
And in particular, this is where I think uh, the emphasis is only really emerging recently is while it's all great to design I mean, wireless physical layer systems, and mesh satellites and all that, all necessary. Like I said, the vast majority of the cost is in the operations of networks. And so automating both the network operation and particularly for fiber, like I said, is we, uh, I have in a different talk that I gave, I, I found out when I was preparing for it that it actually costs less simply because labor costs were lower to deploy I'm the original network of copper lines to provide rural electricity in the United States in the 1930s when I mean, they were, well, machinery was far less developed and we had no GIS systems and any of these other technologies than it costs today to run fiber. Simply our productivity in stringing stuff on poles has not increased. So there's a really great opportunity. Um, and I wish uh, the boring project, instead of tunneling under Las Vegas, would tackle that particular problem uh, uh, to uh, automatically provide robots that deploy fiber uh, in that because we're doing that at, at efficiency that is, hasn't increased much since the 1930s. And, uh, so there's plenty of technical opportunity, but there may be as much civil engineering opportunities as there are, um, let's say, uh, electrical and engineering and computer science opportunities. Thank, thank you, Henning. I think uh, this interesting discussion, hopefully <laughs> you can come in person and give us a talk. So with that, I think that was our last talk and I'm, 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 I'm amazing to see people are still there. Nine o'clock is, we call it midnight seminar series. We used to do that in Telcodia Research, I remember that. Uh, so with this, uh, um, you know, a token of appreciation, this is the ACM Baltimore chapter inaugural seminar. And I have with my colleagues here, uh, token of appreciation, I'll just uh, have this virtual plaque for you, Henning. On behalf of ACM Baltimore chapter extends uh, its appreciation uh, to Professor Henning Children for delivering the inaugural invited talk uh, at the Baltimore Chapter Inaugural Seminar 2022, Laurel, Maryland, uh, February 24, 2022. And this is a new building. Uh, I know you have visited us before. Uh, so next yep. time you come, uh, uh, please visit us again. Um, so with that, uh, again, let's uh, thank Henning. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Henning, uh, again. Uh, Appreciate your talk. So with that, uh, folks, uh, we'd like to thank all the uh, folks who have been attending all around. And um, there are, uh, we had a, we had planned for, to discuss some of the uh, planned activities we're gonna have, I think March 15th, we have a ne next, if I remember, we have March 15th, uh, the next uh, seminar talk. I have a plan to have it uh, every month. And these are some of the Baltimore chapter planned activities I just wanted to highlight. We don't have time to go over this as, I said at the outset, uh, the idea is to really, um, you know, engage the professionals, university folks, uh, startups, government regulators uh, in the DMV area, uh, and students uh, to create a platform so we can uh, talk about how we can contribute to the society using the scientific computing uh, knowledge. And you know, we had three great talks uh, today from uh, Professor Len Kleindrock, history of uh, internet, and um, um, Dr. Uh, Apple Erickson about all the wonderful things that's happening in NASA, even talking about internet in the sky or moving it to space, deep space internet, that's another interesting topic we can hear. And then from Professor Children, we heard how can we take care of the digital divide different ways. Um, there is a lot of activity in connecting the unconnected, we, we can discuss that. Um, so this, this inaugural seminar, I think is solved its purpose and uh, we really want to make it vibrant, and we have support from at least in Johns Hopkins. Your Dr. Raul Samuel uh, has his support. Uh, Johns Hopkins University in Boston, Maryland, Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, in Washington DC area, Howard University, and George Washington. Uh, other university in Virginia uh, is part of DMB. Uh, hope to make it more active. At the same time, I know I was talking to IEEE uh, Princeton section and ACM Princeton section. We have plan to collaborate with other ACM chapters in the world as well. Um, there are a lot of SIGs. Uh, we're trying to create a mo SIG mobile chapter. The next two thing, Open RAND Summit to IEEE Standards Association. We are hoping to collaborate with them. 
It, it will happen most likely here. Uh, then next G Summit, which was announced, that's going to be a, another ACM IEEE conference. Uh, we are also trying to hold the ACM conference, Mobicom 2023. Uh, I've been talking to the leadership. Uh, that will be a big uh, flagship conference. Um, as usual, I know Wale is here. Uh, he has been a professional advocate uh, on the ACM and IEEE fellow side. There are a lot of uh, ways we can advise you how to become distinguished member and fellows, and Wale can probably talk about that. He has been helping that um, quite a lot. Um, I, Wale and Jeff, would you like to say anything uh, to this? Because this is supposed to be kind of a little bit brainstorming before you have the vote of thanks. Uh, if you want to come to the stage, you know, please come home, come over. You know, both of you come over. You know, you want to say anything because this is just you know a few minutes about your ideas because, uh, and then we'll just have vote of thanks and, and conclude. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, uh, I should have just mentioned that, you know, uh, I work on the APL team to uh, develop fellows for professional societies like ACM, IEEE, AGU, and so on. I think people, sh uh, for those of us who are local in APL, take advantage of this opportunity to, to publish or to be part of this uh, vibrant organization that will help you to become fellows of ACM down the road. And for those of you who are on the Zoom from my uh, other organizations, I will encourage you also that if you participate here, you know, your organization, I'm sure, will support you also to become fellows of the future. So I will encourage all of you, take advantage of this and become uh, fellows of, in the future and be like uh, all our distinguished guests that came here today. So thanks uh, for the opportunity for just a few words. So just wanted to, again, um, thank my fellow committee members for uh, helping to put this together. Uh, as Ralph said, it's a long time coming. Um, and I think we've got a great opportunity in front of us. Uh, as I was reflecting on, on Ashutosh's um, comments about all of the uh, local organizations and universities that are in the, in the Baltimore area and, and um, the type of uh, collaborations that we could have. But then looking um, at, the, at, the, at the Zoom site and all of the folks joining from around the world. And so we've got a great community that we can be joined in there also, not just locally, but, but regionally and, and then across the world. So looking forward to the opportunities for collaborating with, with all of you uh, to get, get your energy involved in the chapter and all your great ideas moving forward. We have uh, the next G Summit coming up June 14th. The call for proposals is open. Is open. The call for speaking proposals and the call for um, for participation is open. So we encourage you to be um, to participate in this. Uh, there's lots of opportunities, uh, and so please uh, be be mindful of that and 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 reach out and, and lean in to be a part of this exciting um, next G Summit coming up at APL. Uh, let me just. Uh end up by thanking everybody in this room for staying around for this long seminar. Uh, it's been very rewarding to me, and I'm sure it's been rewarding to you as well. I also want to thank uh, over 150 people on the Zoom uh, for joining us for staying this long as well. This is going to be the beginning of a big thing. We are in a vibrant organization, ACM. Computer science has changed the world, and I think uh, we can change the world again for the next 50 years if we work together. So we encourage you, let's collaborate and change the world again for the next generation to come after us. And we are looking forward to seeing you next month uh, and also in June for the next G Summit as well. Thank you again for coming and really appreciate the time that you've given this conference. Thank you.